Hello everyone, welcome to Gate Academy Global. So now, here in this lecture, we will be dealing with the quick revision part of environmental engineering, right? So basically, I have divided this whole revision session into 11 chapters. And each and every chapter, we will be taking into account all the important formulas and concepts which are essential for your gate examination. So moving to the first one that is your water demand. Here I have mentioned you what is the demand of an LIG family and for an HIG family. LIG seems to be low income group. The full form of LIG is low income group and HIG stands for high income group. If you remember I have mentioned it here without full flashing system and with full flashing system. The difference between the two is Without full flashing system means the water isn't supplied for 24 hours. Well, in the case of full flashing system, water is supplied for 24 hours. Right? So now, the demand is divided into four different types. First is your domestic demand, which contributes to 50 to 60% of the total demand. You will see for LIG family, it is 135 LPCD. For HIG, it is 200 LPCD. Other than that, all the values, be it industrial demand, thefts and leakages, public utilities, like public utilities, example is your clubs, parks, fine. You will see that the value is same both for an LIG and for an HIG family, fine. Now, just one thing, thefts and leakages in that if you see leakages, so bursting of pipelines, if happens, then normally certain amount of water is consumed. So, 55 LPCD is the water. Now, if you see the total for an LIG family, it comes out to be 270 LPCD, while for an HIG family, it is 335 LPCD, right? Now, there is one note that be it hotels, schools or small organizations, you don't need 270 LPCD or 335 LPCD, you need a water supply or basically it is designed for 135 LPCD. Now, I haven't told you regarding LPCD because I think that we are dealing with quick revision, so it is understood. But still, the full form of LPCD is liters per capita per day. That is, amount of water which is required by per person per day in liters is known as LPCD. Right? Now, in case of outbreak of fire, outbreak of fire or any fire related accidents if it occurs, fine. So, a certain amount of water has to be kept in advance for the outbreak of fire. So, certain formulas are there with the help of which you can compute the fire demand, right. These are the empirical formulas. So, you have to substitute the values in the way it has asked, right. Moving to the first one, that is your Kuchling's formula. What is this? Q is equal to 3182 root P. You have to remember very well that this P is population in thousands. Suppose if you have been designing a fire demand for a population of 1 lakh, then here you won't be substituting 1 lakh. You will be substituting 1 lakh divided by 1000, that is 100. So here you will be substituting 100. And the discharge you will be getting will be in liters per minute, right? Now, similarly, in every fire demand formulas, P will be population in thousands and Q will be liters per minute. Freeman's formula, Q is equal to 1136 P by 5 plus 10. In some books, you will find that it is 1135.5 P by 10 plus 10. But we take this value as more prevalent. Right? Now, moving to the National Board of Underwriters formula. In this, you have two different cases. When your population is less than 2 lakhs and when your population is greater than 2 lakhs. So, first one, when your population is less than 2 lakhs, you will be getting a discharge of 4637 root P 1-0.01 root P. Fine? And when your population comes out to be greater than 2 lakhs and you are told to solve by National Board of Underwriters formula, then a provision for 54,600 liters per minute may be made and there should be an extra additional provision of 9100 
to 36,400 liters per minute in case of occurrence for a second fire, right? Similarly, we have the last formula that is your Buston's formula, which is Q is equal to 5663 root P, where P is your population in thousands, right? So these were your fire demands. Now what happens is, obviously if you want to design for a population, all the basically your pumps, your storage reservoirs and all your pipelines. So you have to do the calculations regarding it, fine. So let's move to that. Now, if P is a certain population, let us assume 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs is the population of a city and X is per capita, that is capita means person. So per person consumption of water per day. Then the average daily demand of water is Q is equal to, I denote average daily demand by small q. You can denote with any values here, with any expression you want. The meaning should be clear to you. So small q is equal to Px, where P is your population. X is the per capita consumption of water per day. So the time you get the average daily demand of water, you can find the maximum daily demand, that is the amount of water you will require maximum in a day and the maximum hourly demand. Let us look at that. Maximum daily demand is 1.8 times your average daily demand. Maximum hourly demand is 1.5 times the maximum daily demand. You can substitute the maximum daily demand value from here in terms of average daily demand and you can get 2.7 times the average daily demand. See, here I have written liters per day provided if your Q is in liters per day. You can convert it into million liters per day, fine. You can convert it into meter cube per day. Similarly here also, the value which you will get will be in liters per minute with this empirical formula. But you can convert it later on, fine. And one more thing, you do, just don't get confused. Here, you will be taking normal population. You won't be doing any population in thousands. But in case of fire demand, you have to do population in thousands. Right? This is the difference. You got maximum hourly demand. Now, what happens? The intakes, the main pipelines, they are all designed for the maximum daily demand. Why? Two important things which you have to keep in mind. That your pumps are designed for twice your average daily demand of water and your distribution system is slightly different. It is the maximum of you will calculate MDD plus fire demand or MHD also. Whichever will be maximum will be your distribution system. Right? Now what happens is you are designing your distribution system, storage reservoirs but you won't design it for a year or for two years. Obviously, you will design it for 10 years, 20 years, right? So you have to keep in mind that what will be the population after 20 years or 30 years, right? So you have to forecast the population. You have to predict the population. So there are certain methods with the help of which you can predict or forecast the population. But this method is useful for this type of population. That all will be the variables, like. Moving to the first one, that is your arithmetic increase method. This method is basically used for an old developed cities where rate of change of population with respect to time is constant, right? Now, it is given by Pn is equal to P0 plus Nx bar, where Pn is the population at which year, basically at which the population is asked. P0 is the last population which is known to you. N is the number of decades after which the population is asked. And you know what? What is this decade? 10 years makes one decade, right? If I'm telling you 50 years, that signifies five decades. And X bar is your average arithmetic increase. Now, I'll give you an example. Suppose you have been given population in 1980, you have been given population in 1990, population in 2000, population in 2010 and you have been asked the population in 2020, right? Let me name this as P1, P2, P3, P4, 
right so what will be my p not the last value which is known to me as p4 that is at 2010 and what is pn the population at 2020 and the difference between these two decades is 10 years that is one decade now what is x bar x bar is x1 i'll calculate p2 minus p1 x2 is p3 minus p2 and x3 is p4 minus p3 fine so what will be my x bar x1 plus x2 plus x3 by 3 from here i'll substitute the value of x bar so one thing remember always go from succeeding minus preceding p2 minus p1 never ever you do p1 minus p2 in some cases if you get negative result leave it you will do it from succeeding minus preceding right now moving to the second method that is the geometric increase method this is basically used for a rapidly growing city suppose you assume that uh, there is uh, you can say that um, in your city there has been an it sector which is being newly launched if some tcs company or ibm company is employing people here so naturally what is happening this city will will grow rapidly because engineers from everywhere will obviously come here so what is happening the growth of population is happening rapidly in a geometric manner so here for forecasting population we will use geometric increase method the formula is pn is equal to p0 1 plus r upon 100 to the power n so what is happening pn is same as i told you p not is also same n is the number of decades after which the population is to be known now what is r that i'll tell you now what is r if you will see this r1 will be p2 minus p1 upon p1 into 100 R2 will be P3 minus P2 upon P2 into 100, and R3 will be P4 minus P3 upon P3 into 100. So here you got R1, R2, R3, but you haven't got the R. So what we will do? If in case, in case you have been given P1 and P2, that is initial population and final population, you could use this formula. Root over p2 by p1 minus 1, and here this is n. Don't get confused with this n. This is the number of decades between p1 and p2, and this is the number of decades at which n is to be known after p0. Right? So now this is one method. Second method is by arithmetic method. Just add these value r1, r2, r3 divided by 3 into 100. Or what you can do is R is equal to R one, R two, R three. Like I can do it here. R one, R two, R three. Now, some people who what they do is suppose I am asking at twenty twenty. I know here n value is one, so they'll do it here also one by one. This is wrong. Here this n is number of rates. That is here three r is there, so this will be one by three, right? So you got R substituted here. You will get the population at the year which is desired right so this two method is clear now moving to incremental increase method what happens is in case of arithmetic method you get a lesser value in case of geometric method you get a higher value so the mid value comes around to be for the incremental increase method what is the formula pn is equal to p not plus nx bar plus n n plus 1 by 2 y bar now what is this x bar and y bar let us study that also x bar is basically your average increase in population and y bar is your incremental increase i'll tell you if you see x1 this is same as your arithmetic x2 is p3 minus p2 and x3 is p4 minus Three. So your x bar is x one plus x two plus x three divided by three. This is your x bar, and if you see y bar, so first is your y one x two minus x one, and y two is x three minus x two. So from your y bar you will get y one plus y two by two. 
right so you got x bar y bar substitute the values you will get the answer right and this here also succeeding minus preceding whatever let it be negative also you will do succeeding minus preceding now moving to your decrease growth rate method i have already written like pn pn minus 1 1 plus r minus n r dash upon 100 so what happens is if at 2020 it has asked you 2010 1 plus r n is 1 decade r minus r dash upon 100 where your r is the percentage increase in population and r dash is your increase in percentage decrease sorry decrease in percentage increase is your r dash right so from here you can get the value at the desired population which is asked right now what is logistic curve method this basically there are many formulas in your logistic curve method first i'll tell you the population at which is it is asked ps is your saturation population m is a constant fine suppose you have been given three values that is p0 p1 p2 the values of three different population at three different times so saturation population is calculated at this suppose like at t is equal to 0 p0 was the population at t is equal to t1 your population was p1 and at time twice of t1 you can say the population comes out to be how much p2 so you will use this formula that is 2 p0 p1 p2 minus p1 square p0 plus p2 divided by p0 p2 minus p1 square you will get the saturation population m is a constant you will use this formula ps minus p0 upon p0 and for n you will use this formula for getting the logic uh, basically the population through logistic curve method right so basically all these was important although if you will see that not many questions have been asked in the previous five years almost no question has been asked from the five years in this topic but you can't take a risk so all the important things which were necessary we have dealt it here fine so i hope this is clear to you now we'll move further so now we'll move forward towards the quality parameters of water in this we have three parameters broadly first is your physical then chemical and last we will be dealing with the biological parameters. In physical we have five different types turbidity, color, taste and odor, temperature and specific conductivity of water. So we will be dealing one by one. What is turbidity? Amount of suspended solids present in one liter of the water sample. So this turbidity basically you can measure in four different types that is with the help of turbidity rod. Jackson's turbidity meter, Bayless turbidity meter or nephelometers. Turbidity rod is used basically in the field. Jackson's turbidity is used when sample turbidity is greater than 25 units or 25 ppm. Fine or you can say it as 25 mg per liter. After that you have Bayless turbidity meter. And the last one is your nephelometers, which is most precise and we use this nowadays. This nephelometers measure turbidity less than 1 unit or 1 ppm. So you can imagine how accurate and precise your nephelometers is. The unit is NTU, capital N, capital T, capital U, that is nephelometer turbidity unit, right? After this, you have the color amount of any color or harmful substances in the form of color like color may be due to the presence of any algae components present so we can measure it with the help of an instrument that is your tinto meters and what is your help by which you can measure the color it is 1 mg of platinum cobalt in the form of chloroplatinate ion present in the water right so in this manner you can measure the color and if turbidity is concerned regarding silica you would have heard 1 mg of silica present in 1 liter of your distilled water so silica related it is turbidity and chloroplatinate ion platinum cobalt this is regarding your color the reason i am telling you because sometimes they can ask you in the form of match the following also then you have taste and odor you can measure it with the help of <coughs> sorry threshold odor number 
right and the instrument used is your osmoscope what is your dilution factor in this threshold order number you have a dilution factor which is your vs plus vw upon vs this dilution factor is also sometimes written as a plus b divided by a so what is this vs is your volume of raw water sample which is to be tested because what happens this is vw is the volume of distilled water so you start to add the distilled water to your raw water sample until and unless the smell which was coming it has vanished right and divided by the volume of raw water sample this will give you the dilution factor after this you have the temperature you have written the temperature should be between 10 to 25 degrees celsius for a particular raw water sample last is your specific conductivity conductivity you would be knowing already that it is the reciprocal of resistivity and in our raw water sample or in water sample which is to be delivered to your homes that is from the public water distribution systems it should contain nil that is the amount or concentration of specific conductivity the presence of specific conductivity in water should be nil it shouldn't be present at all so it is determined by dionic Potable dionic water tester and it is expressed in micromoles per centimeter at 25 degree Celsius, right? And its concentration is nil. After this, I'll tell you the concentration of all these also. You don't worry, we'll make a tabular chart and then we'll discuss it. First, I'm telling you what are the various ways in which we can measure the physical parameters, the chemical and biological parameters. Now moving towards the chemical parameters, in this we have total solids which consist of suspended solids and dissolved solids. What is suspended solids? Suspended solids and total solids you can determine now how? That is the question. You take a water sample and you evaporate it. You will get the amount of solids present like you can take a 1 litre of the sample and you evaporate it. Then you will get the amount of solids present in 1 litre of the sample. They will give you total solids. Now what will happen, you take a Wattman filter paper, measure the weight of the filter paper and in 1 litre of the sample you take it which is to be tested and pour the water, the raw water through the filter paper. You will have the suspended solids in the filter paper, measure the filter paper again. Subtract the weight of the filter paper, you will get the amount of suspended solids present in a litre of the sample. So total solids minus suspended solids will then give you the dissolved solids. Right? Now, after this, we have the second chemical parameter as your pH, which is the negative logarithm of H plus ion concentration. And this H plus ion concentration is in moles per litre. Remember this. This is in moles per litre. You often make a mistake that in a hurry, if it is given in mg per litre, you don't bother to convert it into moles and you simply write it in mg per litre. And one of the option will be there, which will be in the form of mg per litre. So, pH is minus log base 10 H plus ion. POH is minus log base 10 OH minus ion. Relation of pH and o, POH is pH plus POH is equal to 14. H plus into OH minus ion will give you 10 raised to power minus 14. Right? Now, after this moving to hardness, from this also questions have been asked previously in gate examination. I am telling you in advance now. What is this hardness? Hardness is the sum of your carbonate hardness and non-carbonate hardness. Carbonate hardness, you call it as a temporary hardness and non-carbonate hardness, you call it as a permanent hardness, right? So basically, what is your hardness? It is due to the presence of calcium and magnesium ions in water. So if there is a presence of calcium and magnesium ions, then you get a hardness in the water because you sometimes you say that water is hard, the soap is, means the clothes are not properly washed. Fine. So what happens is the lather basically is not produced in the soap. So large amount of soap consumption takes place. This, the reason is your water is hard. You tell it like this. So why the water is hard? It is due to the presence of calcium and magnesium ions. Now what happens is you have a temporary hardness which is caused due to the presence of bicarbonates and carbonates of calcium and magnesium. 
Similarly, you have you have non-carbonate hardness, which is caused due to the chlorides, sulfates of calcium and magnesium ions. Right now. We have to have something to measure the hardness, carbonate hardness, non-carbonate hardness. So let's move forward to it. Total hardness, basically we measure in terms of calcium carbonate because obviously we need a parameter on the basis of which we can measure the total hardness. So how is total hardness measured? It is the concentration of calcium ion in mg per liter into equivalent weight of calcium carbonate divided by the equivalent weight of calcium ion plus concentration of mg2 plus ion into equivalent weight of calcium carbonate upon equivalent weight of mg2 plus ion. I will tell you how to calculate equivalent weight for one rest you can calculate. What is the molecular weight of calcium carbonate? It is 100 and what is the valency? It is 2. So 100 divided by 2, you will know that the equivalent weight of calcium carbonate is 50. Similarly for calcium, molecular weight is 40, valency is 2. So equivalent weight comes out to be 20. And for magnesium, it comes out to be 12. Better you remember this, otherwise you can derive it. There is nothing like rocket science in this. Fine? Now, alkanity. What is alkanity? It is due to the presence of carbonates, bicarbonates and hydroxyl ion concentration. We are not dealing with phenolphthalene, methyl orange that P is less than M by 2, P is greater than M by 2. What happens? That you can see in the YouTube lectures. Now, alkanity in terms of calcium carbonate, we will be dealing basics because otherwise the quick revision will go to 30, 40 hours, right? So, alkanity is concentration of SCO3 minus ion into equivalent weight of calcium carbonate upon equivalent weight of SCO3 minus ions. Similarly, for CO3 to minus ions and for OH minus ion also. One, th two things basically which I will tell you in this. First, if in the question concentration of HCO3 minus ion is only given. There is no concentration of CO3 to minus ion, no concentration of OH minus ion. You will take only HCO3 minus ion only. There is no need to do this one and this one into concentration. Second thing, if in the question they give you instead of mg per liter, they give you a milli equivalent per liter, what you have to do? Concentration of calcium ion in milli equivalent per liter into equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. You don't have to divide it by the equivalent weight. Fine, I am telling you the shortcut because milli equivalent to convert it and to justify, I am not here because we are doing the quick revision here now. We can, uh, in our, any lectures, we can deal with separately the derivation part of all that thing. But here I am telling you that if in the question it is written milli equivalent per liter, concentration in milli equivalent per liter into equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. Right? So you got the total hardness, you got the alkanity. Now, I need to calculate the carbonate hardness the non-carbonate hardness. So here I have already mentioned, if you could see, the total hardness is equal to carbonate hardness plus non-carbonate hardness. So total hardness is the sum of carbonate hardness plus non-carbonate hardness. So I have to calculate either carbonate hardness or non-carbonate hardness so that if I will calculate one, I will get the other. So you should know that carbonate hardness is minimum of total hardness and alkalinity. That is, I have to calculate total hardness, I have to calculate alkalinity and whatever will, will be the minimum value will give me the carbonate hardness. Then I will subtract from total hardness, I will get the non-carbonate hardness. Right? Listen to this properly because questions has been asked from this topic specifically. Now, if your total hardness is less than or equal to alkalinity, in that case what happens is, your total hardness is less than your carbonate hardness is equal to your total hardness. Now, if you substitute here in place of total hardness, carbonate hardness, you will get non-carbonate hardness as zero, right? And what happens if your total hardness is greater than alkanity? Your carbonate hardness will be equal to alkanity and your non-carbonate hardness will be equal to total hardness minus alkanity. This is very simple because you can see when your total hardness is greater than alkanity, obviously, what do you see? The minimum will be what? Alkanity only. So, if you remember this, then there is no need to write all these things, I suppose, because you can simply see the minimum value and you can substitute and get the non-carbonate hardness. Right? Now, 
after this we'll draw a tabular chart and we'll compare the permissible limit the cause of rejection for your physical and your chemical parameters so here i have drawn the permissible limit and the cause for rejection for the various parameters turbidity 1 ntu is the permissible limit 10 ntu is the cause for rejection ntu is nephelometer turbidity unit color 5 ntu and cause for rejection is 25 ntu threshold odor number that is taste in order we measure in threshold odor number it is one permissible limit and three is the cause for rejection moving to the chemical parameters you have suspended solids 500 to 100 1000 mg per liter is basically the permissible limit so cause for rejection is generally 2000 mg per liter if you see the alkalinity and hardness they have the similar value of the permissible limit that is 200 mg per liter and the cause for rejection is also similar that is 600 mg per liter right the ph varies from 7 to 8.5 and the cause for rejection is when the ph is less than 6.5 right so after this you have chloride content fluoride content so these values you should remember because sometimes they can ask you in match the following the permissible value for chloride is 200 mg per liter cause for rejection is 1000 mg per liter fluoride is important because here the permissible limit is in a small range of 1 to 1.5 mg per liter many a time questions has been asked that if it exceeds 1.5 mg liter what happens like you have uh, your bone fluorolysis dental cavities or mottling of teeth so that is where this has a specific range 1 to 1.5 mg per liter within this range the fluoride content should be present in water sample right now magnesium also you can see i have written the permissible limit now moving to your nitrogen content this is also very much important because in this we have four different types free ammonia organic ammonia nitrite and nitrate so what happens is in case of your free ammonia you have 0.15 mg per liter as the permissible value 0.3 mg per liter for organic ammonia nil that is no value should be present for nitrite and 45 mg per liter for nitrate i'll tell you that free ammonia is used when there is a recent pollution and what happens in organic ammonia decomposition has not started while the reason for nitrite to be nil is because in this particular stage partly decomposition of organic matter has occurred that is why its concentration should be nil because it is more harmful and what about nitrate if your concentration exceeds by 45 mg per liter then what happens is methemoglobinemia or you can say blue baby disease blue baby syndrome occurs now what it is <coughs> sorry <coughs> if a pregnant lady consumes water in which the nitrate content is greater than 45 mg per liter the infant born has a disease known as blue baby disease or blue baby syndrome that is why its concentration should not be greater than 45 ppm or 45 mg per liter right one more important thing is free ammonia plus organic ammonia leads to k jalal ammonia right so now moving to the biological parameters what happens is first we have mpn that is most probable number this occurs in three stages one is your presumptive confirmative and completed presumptive test indicates the presence confirmative test confirms the presence so what happens is in this you take 10 ml of the raw water sample and you have five tubes what you will do you will take 1 ml from the raw water sample and 9 ml of sterilized water in the first sample then other sample also you will take 9 ml of the distilled water sterilized water and 1 ml of the sample from the previous tube that is first tube in this you do for the five tube so you can get the dilution 1 ml 0.1 ml 0.001 ml in this manner right so what happens basically i'll tell you you can take five test tubes of 10 ml five tubes of 1 ml and five tubes of 0.1 ml you'll add lactose broth to it 
incubate the sample for 24 hours at 35 degrees Celsius. We will see that gases are formed or not. If not, you can incubate it for other 24 hours, other tw another 24 hours and you can see. If gases are formed, then it is a positive test. You can take it to the second stage that is the confirmative test. Here you will add lactose green bile growth to the sample which has the positive test, which has the positive tubes because which have been gases were formed in the first step. The first step that test tubes only you will be taking. You add lactose green bile growth, you can incubate it other, other time also for 35 degrees Celsius and then you will see whether the gases are formed or not. If they are formed, we will count the number of tubes which, get, which gave the positive result. That is, suppose you got 4, 3, 1. That is, 4 tubes of 10 ml showed positive result, 3 tubes of 1 ml showed positive result and 1 tubes of 0.1 ml showed positive result. So, 4, 3, 1 is the most probable number when your 10 ml, 1 ml and 0.5 ml tubes were there. Right? So, now this uh, dilution 5 tubes of 10 ml dilution, 5 tubes of 0.1 ml dilution, this you should know. So, this will give you the most probable number. There is an another way of finding the most probable number that is your Thomson's equation which I have written here that is MPN per 100 ml is equal to number of positive tubes which you are getting into 100 divided by ml of sample in negative tubes that is into ml of sample in all tubes. I am not interested in the um, quantity, I just want the number of positive tubes. 2 test tubes, 5 test tubes, the number of positive tubes and here I am regarding the quantity. I want the ml of samples in negative tubes and the ml of sample in all tubes. So, this will give me the most probable number per 100 ml. Right? After this we have two more tests. One is your membrane filter technique and the last one is your coliform index. Just one thing, in the biological parameters, the concentration of biological organisms in the water should be nil. We don't want any biological organisms to be present in water. Right? So now, membrane filter technique, what happens is, you take a raw water sample, you pass it through a sterile membrane which gathers all the microorganisms which are present. Then there is a nutrient called M endomedium which is added fine and you incubate the sample for 20 hours and you count the number of colonies of coliform formed fine so it will lead to the only the growth of coliform bacteria when you will add M endomedium and you can count the coliform colonies which are formed. That is why you are using a membrane filter technique. The name is this because first you use a sterile membrane, then you use the nutrient called M endomedium, right? Last one is your coliform index. What it is? It is defined as the reciprocal of the smallest quantity of the sample which gives positive B. coli test, right? So basically numericals are asked with your MPN. This till now questions haven't been asked from this particular formula, but you never know. So, I hope this portion of quality parameters of water is clear. I tried to cover maximum things which are important and which are used in solving your gate examinations. Now, we will move further. So, now dealing with the treatment of water. In this, we will start from the sedimentation part because the screening part and your aeration part, we will be dealing in the sewage treatment, right? As you know that screening is basically used for removal of large floating matter, screening in that we use screens. So basically it can be coarse screens or fine screens. So all this we will be dealing in sewage treatment part. So now moving to the sedimentation part, what is sedimentation basically? What happens? Large suspended solids are removed, fine, but they settle down and they are being removed. This sedimentation can be carried out in two ways. Either it can be plain sedimentation or it can be sedimentation with coagulation. Now, what is this coagulation? I will tell you later on. Now, if you want to remove the large suspended solids, basically you will collect the water somewhere. So, obviously you will need tanks. So, now there comes sedimentation tank. This sedimentation tank is broadly classified into two types. 
one is your question type sedimentation tank other one is your continuous flow type sedimentation tank example of your question type sedimentation tank if i talk about basically question type sedimentation tank firstly so what happens is you require basically the detention time is 24 hours and period of cleaning is 8 to 12 hours right and for this we require minimum three number of tanks so that two are operational and one is kept as standby in case of not proper functioning of any of the filters basically sorry any of the sedimentation tank right after this if i ask regarding the design how we design it so it is being designed for maximum daily demand that is 1.8 times the average daily demand question type tank is designed for that quantity of water now moving to the continuous flow type sedimentation tank in this you have two parts one is your horizontal flow type other one is your vertical flow type the example of horizontal flow type is your circular sorry example for your horizontal flow type is rectangular square while example of your vertical flow type sedimentation tank is your circular because in circular it moves up and radially outwards it throws the water right so now what happens is if i am telling that the particles are settling down that is only i told that the particles settle down and that is where the suspended solids are being removed so i want to calculate the settling velocity of the particle but is each and every particle of the same dia which is there in the treatment of water of course not so for different dias we have specified the range and in that range we have a formula for settling velocity with the help of which we calculate the velocity so basically first we have laminar transitional and turbulent if your dia is less than equal to 0.1 mm if it is 0.1 to 1 mm dia and if the dia is greater than 1 mm so now what happens is in your laminar flow you have two formulas if there is no effect of temperature you will take vs is equal to d square upon 80 nu gs minus 1 into g where g is your acceleration due to gravity gs is your specific gravity d is your dia of the particle and nu is your kinematic viscosity now i've written it here that kinematic viscosity is equal to dynamic viscosity divided by the density right now after this you have like in the question they mentioned that ignoring the effect of temperature so you can use this formula the effect of temperature is considered then you will use this formula right this formula if you see they looks approximately similar but there is one difference in transitional you have only d while in laminar you have d square right and since it is an empirical formula the value of d you will substitute in mm temperature in degree celsius and you will get the velocity vs in mm per second right if you look to this formula in this formula you should remember units you can uh, do it yourself like units you can change if you want in centimeter everywhere you put centimeter if you want it in meter per second put it in meters right now after this moving to the surface overflow rate like i told you regarding the settling velocity and all but now i want to know what is the efficiency how much is my sedimentation tank efficient to remove the particles so for that i should know the surface overflow rate this is also known as fictitious velocity superficial velocity also right which is equal to v not is equal to q divided by bl where q is the discharge and width and length are the dimensions of the sedimentation tank if you know that you can calculate the efficiency you got the settling velocity you got the overflow velocity substitute it here you will get the efficiency right now what happens is sometimes if i want to calculate the flow velocity right so this flow velocity vf can be calculated by q upon dh where h is the depth of the tank right now 
this i talked regarding all the things related to your settling velocity overflow rate and efficiency now if i come to the vertical flow type sedimentation tank and i am interested in calculating the detention time or the volume then how could i do so this volume of circular tank is equal to d square 0.785 h plus 0.011 d where h is the depth of the tank d is the dia of the circular tank don't get confused my dear friend this v is volume no not the velocity right and if you know the volume and they are asking you the detention time volume divided by discharge will give you the detention time right now this we talked regarding the everything regarding the sedimentation tank now moving to this coagulation what is this coagulation what happens is if the particle sizes are large normally they will settle down by gravity but there are some fine suspended particles which are floating and they cannot be removed simply by plain sedimentation so what happens is you add certain chemicals these chemicals are known as coagulants so that what will happen these particles will destabilize and naturally they'll agglomerate they'll attach each other because of which they'll settle down under the action of gravity which can be uh, removed subsequently right so the chemicals which are added are known as coagulants and this process is known as coagulation right so there are many types of coagulants basically like you have copperous chlorinated copperous sodium aluminate and many other but basically which one is more prevalent and the questions have been asked on the one which is important that is your alum right this alum if you talk this is the formula of your alum al2so4 thrice dot 18h2 it reacts with alkanating reason i'll tell you alum does not function on acid water it needs alkanity for its proper functioning right so it reacts with alkanity you will get calcium sulfate aluminum hydroxide carbon dioxide and water now what happens is if i'll ask you that when filter alum reacts with bicarbonate alkanity you get three things right first is your flock is produced corrosion of pipeline occurs permanent hardness occurs is it right of course calcium sulfate is permanent hardness aluminum hydroxide is a flock and corrosion of pipeline occurs due to carbon dioxide right so this reaction if you remember no problem you can solve any questions related to it just equate the values like if they will ask you that for 5 mg per liter of filter alum how much calcium sulfate is required you can equate this for this amount this much amount of calcium sulfate is required so for 5 mg per liter how much is required but to calculate the molecular weight of each and every element here or basically the compound here is not possible because it's time taking and we are like shortage of time so what you can do i have written in short all the important uh, basically notes so that this will be helpful for solving the questions right like 1 mg per liter of filter alum requires 0.45 mg per liter of alkanity so that if anybody ask you in a reaction 5 mg per liter of uh, filter alum requires how much alkanity simply multiply it by 0.45 right 1 mg per liter of alkanity in the form of calcium uh, carbonate requires an addition of 0.56 mg per liter of lime in the form of calcium oxide that means see first this calcium hydrogen carbonate will be breakable into two parts that is calcium carbonate and now you will get h2o and also now this calcium carbonate again can be broken into two parts calcium oxide and carbon dioxide so if i want this alkanity first i lead this this will lead to the formation of this and this will lead to the formation of this so if i want calcium carbonate i need calcium oxide for 1 liter if i need 1 mg of calcium carbonate that then for that producing that 1 mg per liter of calcium carbonate i lead 
0.56 mg of calcium oxide in 1 liter of that substance. Fine, in 1 liter of that water basically. Similarly, 1 mg per liter of alum produces 0.23 mg per liter of flock. 1 mg per liter of filter alum produces, flock is what? Aluminium hydroxide. 1 mg per liter of filter alum produces 0.613 mg per liter of calcium sulfate. That is permanent hardness. 1 mg per liter of filter alum produces 0.396 mg per liter of carbon dioxide. Right? Basically questions have been asked from these two only. So, till now they haven't asked regarding these three. It's good if you memorize, otherwise you can find it from this expression provided. If you know, just calculate the molecular weight and you will get the answers. Right? So, I hope this is clear to you. Now, you have added the chemicals, coagulant is added. But this coagulant should be properly mixed with all the water. So, obviously, mixing is required. So, when mixing is required, there is certain power which is to be applied. So, now moving how to calculate the power. This power P is equal to G square mu B, where P is the power dissipated in watts, G is your temporal mean velocity gradient, mu is the dynamic viscosity and V is the volume, right? What happens is, I'll tell you where you make mistake first. In a hurry, they'll give you in the question the velocity and the volume. Since you have the habit of substituting here velocity, here velocity, you, what you do is, you substitute here also velocity. But no, I have mentioned volume of raw water to which power that is P is applied in meter cube. Right? Now, this G plays a very vital role. If the concentration of G is very large, right, as I mentioned, and the detention time is small, then what will happen? Dense flow but in small quantity will be produced. And if you reverse it, that is in place of larger, if the G is smaller, detention time is larger, then what will happen? In place of dense, you will get a light flock, but in large quantity. Right? So this you should remember. Now, we have moved in the sequence of each and every treatment, sedimentation, sedimentation with coagulation, then how the coagulation, basically mixing basin. Now what will happen? We want to filter the water. Because what happens is, this is basically the public water distribution treatment. Because like everybody can't afford your Kent or you can say any aqua guard water purifiers. So it's the duty of the government that they'll provide you the water which is safe for drinking. Additional filtration and all you are doing for your purpose. Fine, it, you are doing for your satisfaction that oh god I'm drinking a clean water. But it's the duty of the government so they are doing it. So the, now moving to the filtration part, what happens in the public water distribution system. Now, this filtration is basically divided into two broad categories. First is your gravity filter, other one is your pressure filter. Gravity filter is again divided into two parts, slow sand gravity filter and your rapid sand gravity filters. Right? I will tell you the difference between the two. Slow sand gravity filter requires a larger area for its functioning, 100 to 2000 meters square. While amount of area required for rapid sand gravity filter is 99 meters square, 100 meters square, that's it. Right? The rate of filtration is very low for your slow sand gravity filter as compared to your rapid sand gravity filter. Right? It uh, approximately it is 3000 to 6000 liter per hour, while for here it is 100 to 200. So you can see that it's very less and like for a heavy populated area, obviously you need a filter unit which gives you a large rate of water fine, after filtration. So now, the advantage of slow sand gravity filter is that Bacterial removal efficiency is 97%, 98%, while for rapid sand gravity filter, it is 85%, 80 to 85%, right? So now, you can see that then what's the use? Then we should use slow sand gravity filter. But my dear students, after rapid sand gravity filter, we'll be doing disinfection. 
so all these problem will be eliminated because in disinfection obviously the bacterial removal efficiency related to bacteria and all if any uh, substance is present you can remove it in disinfection right now for cleaning slow sanitary filters because obviously continuous operation you need cleaning after it so what happens like you have filter materials in the gravity filters first is your sand of different grades then you have gravel so 1.5 cm to 3 cm of the top layer of sand is removed that is scraping or that is scraping a removal of 1.5 to 3 cm of the top sand occurs in slow sand gravity filters and the amount of filtered water which is used is 0.2 to 0.6% while in the case of rapid sand gravity filters if you want to clean the filter so basically you can't do scraping what you will do you will provide a back washing velocity that is from the other direction opposite direction you will be spraying the water so that any impurities which is clogging in the sands will be removed right and 2 to 5% of the filtered water is required in your rapid sand gravity filters period of cleaning in slow sand is 1 to 3 months while in rapid sand is approximately in one day and after you can say 12 hours 18 hours you have to do the cleaning right so now what happens is in rapid sand filters you have many uh, number of filter units are there so number of filter units if you want to calculate it so you can do it in with this empirical formula by worrell and mollus that is n is equal to 1.22 root q where n is the number of filter units q is the plant capacity in billion liters per day right now what happens is when you will provide the back washing velocity sometimes you say that after 8 hours cleaning is required when it is densely like it is doing the continuous operation of large quantity of water to be filtered after 2 hours 3 hours also sometimes you require to clean it fine if it has deteriorated or depreciation has occurred of that filter right so now what is happening initially the thickness was l and after your back washing obviously the bed has expanded so now le is the expanded thickness so this relation holds true that is original thickness into 1 minus initial porosity is equal to le that is expanded thickness and ne is your expanded porosity right this will be equal now this question regarding this question has been asked already if they'll give you any three things and they'll give you uh, and they'll ask you the other one so you can ca simply calculate but if they'll give you two things and they want one thing so what will happen like suppose they'll give you initial thickness initial porosity and you are made to calculate they have asked you to calculate the expanded thickness so obviously you need expanded porosity how you will calculate so this is the formula ne is equal to vb upon vs to the power 0.22 where this vb is the backwash velocity in meter per second that is amount of water which is required fine so basically the velocity of water which is required for backwashing and vs is your settling velocity in meter per second which can be calculated from this formula right now filtration is clear now for any bacteria pathogens disease causing bacteria we need to do disinfection this get infection basically can be done by boiling fine you can do it by treatment with ozone ultraviolet rays treatment potassium permanganate any ways you can do it but for a large population we prefer chlorination right this chlorination cl2 when added with water it will work when your ph is greater than 5 will lead to the formation of hcl hypochlorous acid plus hcl that is hydrochloric acid this hcl will split into two parts when the ph is greater than 8 that is h plus plus ocl minus if the ph is less than 7 you will get get the opposite one right so ph has to be greater than 8 for getting this reaction 
OCl minus is your hypochlorite ion and HOCl is your hypochlorous acid. Then this reaction is in this relation is basically important. HOCl upon HOCl plus OCl will is equal to 1 upon 1 plus K upon H plus. Where K is your reaction rate constant and H plus is the hydrogen ion concentration in moles per liter. Right? This portion. Now, if you want to see the percentage killing of bacteria, then how can we do that? What is the basically the time it happened? So this is the relation. With Chick's law, T that is time is equal to 1 upon K, K is a constant, log base E, N0 upon NT. That is uh, percentage of bacteria at time T is equal to 0 and bacteria at time at any time T basically. Right? So from this you will get the time required. Right? Now, what happens is if I am telling that I want the same percentage of killing of bacteria but I want it at a different temperature, then what is the time at which same percentage of killing of bacteria occurs? Suppose at T1 degree Celsius, T1 was the time, right? Now, if T2 degree Celsius is the temperature, then what amount of time is required for same percentage of killing of bacteria? So, this is the formula log base E T1 upon T2, that is here it is time, is equal to E by R T2 minus T1 upon T1 into T2. Fine, where E is your activation energy, R is your gas constant, right? And remember, if they will give you temperature in Celsius, you have to convert it into Kelvin because T2 and T1 are the temperature in Kelvin, right? So these are the important things regarding chlorination and if you want to test of chlorine, you can do it by uh, orthotolodyne test, chlorotex test, DPD test, they all are also there, right? Now, there are various types of chlorination like plain chlorination, free chlorination. So let us discuss that fastly. I haven't written it here. Plain chlorination is only when chlorine is added, no amount of treatment, nothing is being given, right? Pre-chlorination happens, like you have seen after filtration, we are giving the chlorination. Pre-chlorination happens before filtration or before sedimentation with coagulation. If we are providing or if we are applying chlorine, then it is known as pre-chlorination. And what is post-chlorination? Post-chlorination occurs when after this whole treatment, we are applying the chlorine. So that is known as your post-chlorination. Post-chlorination and pre-chlorination together is known as double chlorination, right? And now suppose if there is outbreak of disease at some place, right? Then obviously the water has to be pure because maximum amount of disease occurs because of harmful water, basically any water which is containing pathogenic bacteria or any harmful substances. So what will happen, you have to add the chlorine beyond the amount which you were adding initially. So what will happen, this is known as super chlorination that due to outbreak of epidemic you are adding large amount of chlorine. And sometimes you have to remove the chlorine that is known as dechlorinization. So in this dechlorinating agents are basically your sodium thiosulfate activated carbon, these are your dechlorinating agents, right? Now, obviously, if somebody asks you regarding the dosage, so dosage of chlorine is basically equal to the demand of chlorine plus residual chlorine. Now, if somebody asks you, just for your information, that why this residual chlorine is important? The reason is that like the treatment was occurring from the pipeline, it is being supplied to your homes, the treatment occurred. But at the moment, suppose if you are drinking the water and at that instance, if there is any bacteria then, so for removing that instance also that amount of bacteria which is present before you consume that water, certain amount of residual chlorine has to be present to kill that bacteria, right? That is why we have a residual chlorine also, right? I hope this is clear to you regarding chlorination. Now moving to the water softening part. Why we need to uh, means soften the water? Because if the water is hard, proper amount of lather 
or you can say flog is not produced which leads to increase in laundry expenses right now hardness can be temporary or it can be permanent as i already told you temporary hardness can be simply removed by boiling or by addition of lime i have written the expression also while if you go for permanent hardness special treatment methods like lime soda process zeolite method demineralization is required and if somebody ask you that in which you get the zero hardness so in zeolite method you get the zero hardness so now if there are different types of hardnesses and you have to require chemicals to remove it so you won't be needing the same chemicals for any type of hardness you need different chemicals so here i have mentioned if you have alkanity then for removing it you need lime similarly for removal of calcium chloride or calcium sulfate which is the permanent hardness then you will need soda that is na2co3 right if the hardness is in the form of magnesium chloride or magnesium sulfate then in addition with na2co3 that is soda you will need lime also i am telling you because what happens if somewhere they'll ask you regarding what are the chemicals which are being which are used for the treatment of magnesium sulfate so you don't get confused that only na2co3 is required lime is also required fine so i hope you are clear with this whole formulas which we have discussed basically regarding the treatment of water so now we'll be starting regarding the distribution and conveyance part what are the important things which are considered in this fine so first we'll be dealing regarding the layout of the distribution network what happens in the layout of the distribution networks right so in this basically you have the four different types of distribution networks first is your dead end system second is your grid iron system ring system radial system fine so basically these are the four systems what does the system tells these are the networks laying of network pipelines which tells you that there are different ways in which water can be supplied to your homes right moving to the first one that is the dead end system what happens is there is a main supply pipeline name it m from this main supply pipeline you have the branches or you can say sub mains s now what happens there could be some other pipeline through which water can enter your homes that is water can be supplied to your homes or there can be some other pipelines also now what is the disadvantage of this dead end system is suppose some work is going on at this particular position suppose there is a leakage happening or laying of extra pipeline is happening anything so this portion gets affected because there is no other way through which water can be supplied right so this is your dead end system now second is your grid iron system what happens is in this by the name only you can see that there is a formation of grids there is a formation of grids grids are being formed and what happens the main su supply pipeline is running around the periphery and you can be supplied like if i want the water at this position i can get water from this pipeline this pipeline this pipelines so there are different ways even though if there is a construction going on leakage going on to any one part i can get the water through the other part also so this is the condition of your grid iron system you call it as an interlaced system or reticulum system also right now ring system is also like that you can get it from other ways also like you don't have to be dependent on the main supply pipeline or sub main pipelines there are various other branches through which you can get the water similarly of radial system radial system is like this radially these are this this part this part this part this part so what happens is you have a in this what happens is you can put a distribution reservoir here and you can get water you can water can be taken out in different ways in different directions basically you can get the water you can put your distribution reservoir or elevated reservoir at that particular position right 
So basically, these are the four layout of your distribution networks. Now, what happens? What are the methods by which water can be supplied? This was the layout, the layout of the pipelines, how they are being laid so that you receive water. But what is the method by which you get water? So, by the means of gravity, that is with the help of gravity, that is water is flowing under the action of gravity, water can be delivered to your homes by pumping system or what can happen, partly you can use a gravitational system or, and partly you can use the pumping system. So combined way also, you can get the distribution of water in your homes, right? Now, you got these two. Now, what is the storage capacity of distribution reservoir? If you have seen, you have a large elevated tanks, you can say, in which the water is being stored. So obviously, you will having a, some figure in your mind, some number in your mind that such amount of water should be stored in that distribution reservoir. So what is this? It is the sum of all these three, that is balancing storage, breakdown storage and fire storage. Now, I'll tell you quickly what is balancing storage first. What happens? The supply won't be varied. There will be a constant rate of supply irrespective of the excess demand or excess supply. We are not bothered about this. I am telling you that there should be a constant rate of supply. That's it. So what happens is, if I am desiring a constant rate of supply, obviously I have to do calculations, I have to determine it. So you can do it either by analytical method or by plotting graph. That is, by mass curve method, you can plot the graph and you can determine the balancing storage which is required. I'll tell you. In this, in x-axis, you get the time and hours plotted. Here you have the excess rate of supply. So this is the, this is your constant rate of supply. Now. If I plot the supply and demand, the excess supply and the excess demand is I'm plotting it on the y axis. If this is my constant rate of supply, <coughs> if this is my constant rate of supply, so what you can see at this position, I am needing a lesser value than the constant rate of supply. So this will be my excess supply by supply is more than my required amount which I need and at this position the curve is above the constant rate of supply that is my demand is in excess this B ordinate is of what excess demand so the total storage required is excess supply plus excess demand right so this way if you plot the graph you can get the balancing storage or you can say the equalizing storage there Breakdown storage also in this you have a numerical figure like 25% of the total storage capacity of the reservoir. You take it as a breakdown storage or 1.5 to 2 times the average hourly supply is considered as the breakdown storage for emergency conditions. Right? Third, moving to the fire storage. This we have already discussed when we were dealing with the fire demand, be it Cushling's formula, Buston's formula, National Board of Underwriters formula, any formula. With the help of the population, if you know the population, you can calculate the fire demand. But still, you have to keep in some mind that some amount of figure should be there. So generally, you take three jets of water, delivering water at a rate of 1100 liter per minute, generally for 10 hours, is considered for fire storage or you can simply calculate with the help of formulas as well right now this portion is clear this portion is generally not asked i'll tell you in advance only in paper in your gate examination but still what happens i believe like they can give you all these three and they'll ask you that the, what is the storage capacity of distribution reservoir a b a b c a c so if you they give you such permutation and combinations if you're well aware with their names you can solve it fine Similarly, if you want to know that anywhere detection occurs in the underground distribution pipes, so what, how can you determine it? This is also you should know. So you can determine it by direct observation. You can see it if any leakage occurs with the help of direct observation. You can detect it or with the help of sounding rods. 
similarly by plotting the hydraulic gradient line you plot the graph various pressure at various points if you get a kink at a certain point that means there is a leakage occurring fine similarly by using waste detecting meters dickens waste meters basically most prevalent which is being used with the help of this also you can detect the leakage in the underground distribution pipes fine so basically on these questions they can give you three options and they can ask you a b c which of these are correct that's why I have, for you to know and well aware of these terms i have told you now basically focusing on your pipe appurtenances on which match the following questions can be asked right the various types of valves and what are they used for what are their basic purpose that is important for you now first is your sluice valve or gate valve what is the main aim of this valve it regulates the flow of water in the pipeline so if they'll ask you like in the match the following one side they'll give you valves and the other side side they're functioning or what are the way in which they are used so you should be aware of both these names they can either ask for gate valve or sluice valve so you should remember that both of them have the same function that is they are the same they are the synonym of each other so they are used to regulate the flow of water through the pipe moving to the second one that is air valve or you also call it as air relief valve what happens is when water is being carried through the pipeline it also carries every time maximum time it carries air with it so due to the accumulation of air blockage occurs fine so to prevent this basically we use air relief valve and due to blockage what happens a backward pressure is also created that is why air valve or air relief valve is used i have written it here voting water flowing through the pipeline always carries some air with it due to accumulation of air a backward pressure is created which causes blockage to the flow of water to prevent the air accumulation air relief valve is used right so the name you can see that air relief valve so obviously it, it will prevent the accumulation of air now reflux valve or you call it as a check valve non returning valve by the name you can see check valve non returning valve it means it allows the water to flow in one direction only that is it allows the water to flow in uni direction right so this is your reflux valve or you can say it as a check valve or non returning valve right now moving further to the relief valve or safety valve what is its function you can see relief valve safety valve what happens sometimes due to excess of pressure you can say bursting of uh, bursting occurs fine so to prevent this bursting what happens bursting of pipe you use this relief valve or safety valve right now fifth one is your scour valve blow off valve or drain valve these are the same synonyms of each other so i just um, tell you that basically you should remember this because they can ask you match the following with the help of any name or sometimes they what happens is they can give you a condition like bursting of pipelines occurs which type of valve is suitable and they'll give you four options so you should be well aware with either you call it a relief valve or you call it a safety valve right now what is scour valve blow off valve what happens is if any amount of sand or silt is present fine for draining that or for removing that etc we use this scour valve or you can say blow off valve or drain valve right now foot valve this foot valve is used whenever there is debris present so to prevent its entry you use the foot valve for preventing the entry of debris into the pumping system you use the foot valve right now coming to the butterfly valve what it is to regulate the flow now you say ma'am here also you told that sluice valve is used for regulating the flow here also you are telling that butterfly valve is used for regulating and stopping the flow it's okay but butterfly valve is specially used in large size conduits or you can say large size pipes they we basically use butterfly valve right now 
Moving to globe valve, this is used for smaller dia pipes. We generally use this globe valve. Now, next is your needle and cold valve. This needle and cold valve has similar functioning. That is, it regulates the flow like you have seen it butterfly valve or sluice valve. But what happens is, in this case, this needle and cone valve is expensive as compared to your butterfly valve or you can say your sluice valve. And this is basically used for throttling flow. That is whenever there is a choking occurs. In such cases, we use this needle and cone valve. Right? Now, tenth one is your ball valves or ball float valves. You know, uh, especially those students or those people who are having your underground uh, tanks basically if you have in your homes. So what happens is, for maintaining the constant level of water, what happens if you get an excess amount of supply? So the water shouldn't get overflow. So in that case is basically you use ball walls or ball float walls. So many of you have already seen especially this walls. This is used to maintain a constant level in a service reservoir also or elevated tanks also. So that to prevent overflow of water. Right? Now, moving to the 11th one, that is the pilot valve. What happens is, sometimes whenever there is a high pressure of water is happening in a pipeline, in that places, basically pilot valve is used. Stop cocks, these are smaller slice sluice valves. Sluice valve is used for what? It is used for regulating the flow of water, as I told you earlier. So this stop cock, what it does is, it is connected to wash basins to regulate the flow of water, but these are smaller size sluice valves. Right? Now, water meters. This meter word sometimes whenever it added, you should understand that obviously it is measuring something. So here also, this water meter is a device by which quantity of water, the amount of water which is flowing through a particular point is measured. So this is your water meter. Then, you have a fire hydrant. This is also an outlet which is provided in the main water supply pipeline. Fine. So this is the fire hydrant which is being used. So these were the 14 types of basically the pipe apprentices. There could be many more, but what are the important ones which we have we have discussed it here, right? Now, what happens whenever there is a complex pipeline? Suppose the pipeline is entering, this is moving, some amount of flow is occurring. So whenever such sort of complex pipeline occurs, so you have to analyze it the amount of water which is flowing through each and every pipeline. So these two rules you have to keep in mind. That is the algebraic sum of pressure drop around a closed loop must be zero. That is there should be no discontinuity. Whatever pressure drop occurs in this closed loop, it should be zero. Secondly, the flow which is entering the junction must be equal to the flow leaving the junction. That is in flow, should be equal to your outflow. So these are the two complex pipe net networks rules which are used for the analysis of it. And if you go through any method, so basically Hardy Cross method is used for the analysis of your complex pipe network. Right? So I've told you what are the important things, what are the things which are being used in the distribution and conveyance system, be it pipe, pipe apprentices, the storage required, each and everything. Fine? So now we'll move further. So now we'll be dealing with the wastewater characteristics, all the terminologies and important formulas which have been considered. So now, First, we'll be dealing with some of the terminologies so that you should be clear what it is. Refuse is basically the waste in the form of solid, semi-solid or liquid. Fine. Now, dealing with rubbish, first you deal with the garbage part. Garbage is something, it is the waste which is organic in nature. If you consider the examples, be it your food waste, garden trimmings, they all come under the category of your garbage. And if you go on the contrary to the rubbish part, rubbish is the waste which is inorganic in nature. If you take the examples, example will be your cardboard, these are the examples of your rubbish. Now, 
If you go to the sanitary sewage, it is the sewage from your domestic sewage and from your industrial sewage. And specifically, if you go to the terminology of sewage, it is the liquid waste which contains 99.9% .9 approximately water and 0.1% of solid. Right? And wherever is sanitary sewage, it is the summation of your industrial sewage plus your domestic sewage. Moving to your salage, salage is the waste generated from your kitchens, from bathrooms. So it is a liquid waste generated from kitchens, from bathrooms. So you use the term salage, right? Now, moving to the dry weather flow. Dry weather flow is basically the sanitary sewage which is generated in any season. And in short of dry weather flow, you in short you say it as DWF, right? Now. What is total solids, suspended solids and dissolved solids? Let us see that. This is the chemical characteristic of sewage basically. Just one physical characteristic if I consider regarding the color. So color initially is yellow or light brown, light gray you can say basically. But after few days when it is kept, so it becomes dark brown in color and sometimes black as well. Right? Now. Considering the total solids, suspended solids and dissolved solids. I will be a little quick. Please pay attention. What happens? Total solids is the summation of your suspended solids, colloidal solids and dissolved solids. What happens? First, I will calculate the total solids. So, what I will take? I will take the amount of solid sewage basically and I will evap evaporate it. So, the solids which is left per litre of the solution, suppose I am taking x litre or 1 litre and I am getting the so total amount of solids in mg. So, I will express mg per litre, I am getting this much amount of solids. So, let me name it as S1 is the amount of solids which I am getting. Now, I want to calculate the suspended solids. So, what I did is, for suspended solids, I took a filter paper and what I did, all I poured the sewage in it. So, what happened was, I got the amount of solids in the filter paper. So that is the suspended solids which was present per litre of the wastewater or solution. Right? So I got this total solids, I got the suspended solids. And before beginning this, I told you that total solids is the summation of suspended plus colloidal plus dissolved. So you got total solids. You got suspended solids. It is also known as non-filterable solids because obviously through filter paper it was not able to pass, right? So total amount of solids minus non-filterable solids will give you dissolved solids plus your colloidal solids, right? So you got this S3. Now what happens is suspended solids is itself composed into two parts. One is your volatile solids. And the other one is your non-volatile solids or you can say it as a fixed solids. Now I am interested in knowing the fixed solids concentration. Come and tell me the fixed solid concentration. So what happens is there is an electric muffled furnace. If you pour this non-filterable solids or suspended solids in the electric muffled furnace at 550 degrees Celsius for about 15 to 20 minutes, you would be able to see that the volatile solids evaporated or you can say the volatile solids uh, just they evaporated basically only. So what will happen is you can compare the weights. So you will get what is the amount of solids which got volatile. So total suspended solids minus volatile solids will give you the fixed suspended solids. Right. So this only I have mentioned it here. S2 minus S4 will give me S5. Now what happens, sometimes you are interested in calculating the settleable solids. So settleable solids, if you want to calculate, then Himhoff cone apparatus is there. With the help of which you can calculate the settleable solids. Basically, you can keep the whole wastewater concentration for about 2 hours and there is a graduations in this. So you don't need to see anything else. You can simply see the graduations if you make the solution to be there in the Himhoff cone apparatus and you can know that what is the amount of solids which got settled. Right? So I am telling you what is the use of Himhoff cone and what is the use of your muffled furnace because in the questions if they are only telling that with the help of muffled furnace certain amount of solids were generated etc. So you should know that muffled furnace is used, the reading which you are getting is for your volatile suspended solids, right? So now, 
moving to the terminology part for all these things for all the main important things which we have been starting dissolved oxygen the oxygen required for the oxidation of organic matter is termed as dissolved oxygen your dissolved oxygen is inversely proportional to temperature that is when your temperature increases your dissolved oxygen decreases and vice versa if you want to calculate dissolved oxygen it is done with the help of Rinkler's method. With the help of Rinkler's method, you can compute it. Right? Yeah. Moving to your chemical oxygen demand. In short, you say it as COD. It is the oxygen required for the oxidation of biologically active and biologically inactive organic matter. That is biodegradable organic matter plus non-biodegradable organic matter comes under the category of chemical oxygen demand. And on the contrary, if you see biochemical oxygen demand, it is the oxygen required for the oxidation of biodegradable organic matter only. That is why your COD is greater than your BOD, right? Theoretical oxygen demand, if you want to consider, I'll explain you with the help of an example. If you see, this is glucose 66 h 12 o 6 You're treating it with oxygen, you're getting 6 CO2 plus 6H2O, right? So now what is happening is, here you can see, <coughs> if I say that here nothing is there, that means 1 is there. So 1 mole of glucose requires 6 mole of oxygen. I can calculate the molecular weight also. So if somebody is asking, x mole of glucose will require how much oxygen i can normally calculate it with the help of this chemical expression so what is happening this is the theoretical oxygen demand that is it is the total amount of oxygen that is required for the oxidation of organic matter and in short we name it as thod and basically if you see that which one is greater out of this th three so THOD and COD is approximately equal, but then too theoretically oxygen demand is slightly greater than your COD and COD is greater than your BOD, right? This much is clear. Now moving faster. BOD, standard BOD, you should know it. We calculated for five days at 20 degrees Celsius. Reason, because almost 68% of the matter get oxidized or you can say two by three of the matter gets oxidized first thing next you can calculate it bod with a formula just one thing this in place of time here i have written five days and in the place of t capital t degree celsius it is 20 degrees celsius and now if you are interested in calculating bod at any time at any temperature you can use this formula where l is your ultimate bod remember this and this ultimate DOD, BOD does not change. Whether you are calculating it for 5 days, 20 degrees Celsius, 5 days, 37 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, be it anything, your ultimate BOD will remain same. It does not depend upon the time, upon the temperature. Right? So now, you calculated it from here. Suppose, if you are taking it here at 37 degrees Celsius, or let us suppose 30 degrees Celsius, so here also, this oxygenation constant, basically, you have to take it for 30 degrees Celsius. Now in the question, they generally give it for 20 degrees Celsius because it is the standard one. So for any other temperature, what you can do, you can calculate it from this formula. What you have to do in the place of T, at 30 degrees Celsius, you needed to calculate it, just substitute 30 degrees Celsius, right? And substitute in this formula, you will get the BOD. And in place of time, suppose they are asking for 3 days. So just you have to multiply by 3 because this small t is for time, 3 days, right? Now, there is other formula. This was the formula when your base was E. This is your formula when your base is 10. One hint basically when to use a which formula. Basically, when your K20 value, that is your KD value, 20 degrees Celsius, if it gives around 0.23 per day or 0.22 per day, so what happens, you take this base E formula and when they give you K20 degrees Celsius value around 0.11 per day or 0.10 per day, you take this value, right? 
Now, leave all this. In place of this, if they give you dilution, dissolved oxygen, dilution factor, some sort of these terms they will give you, fine. So, how can you calculate the BOD? So, BOD for 5 days at 20 degrees Celsius can be calculated by this is dissolved oxygen, short I have written, initial minus dissolved oxygen final into dilution factor. Now, dilution factor if you want to calculate, there are two ways. Either they can give you the volume of sewage, yes I have mentioned Vs, the volume of water Vw. So, in this manner you can calculate dilution factor and sometimes what happens is they can give you if 5% of the solution is there, something like that. So, what will happen? Dilution factor is 100 upon x percentage. They will give you. Fine. And like Vs, Vw, like they will give you 5 ml of sewage, 295 ml of water. They will give you some sort of these statements. So, you can calculate dilution factor through this formula also. Right. Now, if it is a 2 marks question, so they will give you volume of sewage, volume of water and they will ask you 5 days BOD. So, DO initial or DO mix can be calculated through this formula. That is Vs, volume of sewage, dissolved oxygen of sewage, volume of water, dissolved oxygen of water. So, from here you can calculate DO initial, DO final will be given to you and dilution factor also you can calculate. Fine, you will substitute it, you will get the BOD for 5 days at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, moving further. I told you that TUHOD is greater than COD is greater than BOD, that only I have written it here. Now, moving to two most important terms, population equivalent and relative stability. What is population equivalent? It is defined as the ratio of total demand. What is the total demand of a BOD of a city? Divided by the BOD per person per day. Fine. So, individual, well, first you will take total demand of the BOD of a city per day divided by individual person's BOD per day. If in the question individual BOD is not been mentioned, you can take it as 0 0.08 kg per day is the BOD produced by an individual. But generally they mention it. Right. Now, Moving to relative stability, relative stability as I mentioned it is here, amount of oxygen which is present in the effluent, if you are discharging the effluent, the amount of oxygen which is present in the effluent divided by the amount of oxygen that is required for the decomposition of, I have mentioned it here, first stage carbonaceous matter. If you will remember, we have two BOD, first stage BOD, second stage BOD. First is your carbonaceous one, second one is your nitrogenous one. But basically we consider our carbonaceous organic matter. So here also if you will see what is happening, first we will see the amount of oxygen which is present in the effluent which we are disposing it of divided by the amount of oxygen that is required for the decomposition of first stage organic carbonaceous matter, right? Now, you can calculate it if you go to the expression format, 100 minus 0 0.794 T20 degree Celsius, 101 minus 0 0.604 T37 degree Celsius. What do you do? Sometimes you make mistakes, I don't know why. You take the temperature here. No, it's not like that. This T20 degree Celsius and T37 degree Celsius are number of days. I have that's why written are the number of days at 20 degree Celsius at 30 and 37 degree Celsius. So if they are giving number of days at 20 degree Celsius, you use this formula, and for 37 degree Celsius, you use this formula. Right? So I hope this yeah, everything is clear to you. One more thing. As I told you that for dissolved oxygen, you take a Rinkler's method test, you do Rinkler's method test. Similarly, what you do for chemical oxygen demand, you do a dichromate test, fine, K2CR2O7, there is a test basically for computing your chemical oxygen demand. So, you do a dichromate test for evaluating COD, right. So, these were some of the important things basically which we have considered exclusively BOD questions are being asked on this topic but still I wanted that other things should be known to you right. So, I hope this wastewater characteristics is clear to you. So, now we will deal all the important formulas, important concepts regarding the sewage system. Now, just first, we'll give a, I'll give a small introduction, what is your sewage system. 
so basically the collection and conveyance of sewage is known as your sewage system right it can be of three different types i have written the names but before knowing what are these three different types let me explain you two terminologies first one is your dry weather flow another one is your storm water so what is your dry weather flow it is basically the sanitary sewage which is generated in any season now in sanitary sewage what comes into picture your domestic sewage and your industrial waste or basically your domestic waste and industrial waste leads to the formation of sanitary sewage so it is the sanitary sewage which is generated in any season is known as your dwf or you can say it as dry weather flow now what is your storm water basically we say that the rain water is your storm water but basically the runoff generated along the roads or the uh, you can say roads buildings or catchment areas that is known as your storm water now what happens is in separate sewage system there is two different pipelines you would have seen generally you would have seen the circular sewer pipelines which carries the sewer from your homes to your basically to the treatment plant or to a basically a branch sewer then to a main sewer pipeline so these sewer pipelines are generally circular but let's not talk about this focusing on the separate sewage system what happens is your dry weather flow and your sanitary sewage or basically you can say your storm water and your dry weather flow there are two different pipelines in one there will be a discharge from your dry weather flow and another there will be a discharge from the storm water this is basically used in hilly areas with deep excavation is not at all possible fine moving to the other one that is your combined now you'll understand better dry weather flow and your storm water they can get intermixed there is no separate pipeline there is only one pipeline which will carry the discharge from both your storm water and your dry weather flow will be what you it will be your combined sewage system this is used in hilly areas sorry basically this is used in your plain areas where deep excavation is possible and this was used in your hilly areas where there was uneven rainfall distribution where deep excavation was not possible now moving to the partially combined system as the name suggests a part will be there a part of the storm water will be mixed with your dry weather flow and a part won't be right so this is your partially combined system now whenever i ask you like suppose i want to know the amount of dia to be designed for a certain population and i want to know the dia based on a combined system i am talking about and i want to know the dia of the sewer pipeline so what i have to do i have to calculate the discharge of dry weather flow i have to calculate the discharge of storm water i'll add both of them discharge is equal to area into velocity velocity will be given i can find out the area and i'll do pi by 4 d square i'll get the dia so now the concept will be clear that the discharge will be the sum of your dry weather flow and your storm water so now what happens is if p was the population of a city and x is the per capita water supplied per liters per capita water supply in a day then what happens is total water supply this already we have started in the first chapter of water demand that is population into per capita water demand so this much is the amount of water which is supplied to your home but it is assumed that 70 to 80 percent of the water supply is converted to waste water so basically this is your average sewage flow rate i have written here 70 to 80 percent but in the question since if it has been a conventional questions you would have assumed this value but in gate examination generally they define a value so just for explanation purpose i am writing 70 to 80 percent but in the examination if it has mentioned you then go through that value right now what happens is while we are designing for dry weather flow you have to take three times the average sewage flow rate this value also in books you can find 2 2.5 they generally mention it but if they don't mention it generally as conventional questions are there we take three times the average sewage flow rate fine so from here you will get dry weather flow name it equation 1 you got the discharge from here 
Now we'll move to the storm water calculation. This is a rational formula. Now what happens is this Q is equal to storm water discharge basically is equal to 1 by 36 kpca that is critical rainfall intensity in centimeter per hour. Let me tell you one thing which you can often make mistakes. Since you know that the discharge is in meter cube per second, you have the habit of substituting here the value in meter per hour and area in meter square. You don't have to do this, fine. This is a rational formula. So critical rainfall intensity will be in centimeter per hour, area will be in hectare, right? So now, what happens is this critical rainfall intensity is dependent upon the time of concentration. That is the time taken by the last uh, drop of rainfall or last drop of water to contribute to the catchment area. Fine. So this is your time of concentration. They can directly give you time of concentration or they can give you two times. One is your overflow flow time. Another one is your channel flow time. In simple languages, sometimes they also say it as time of entry plus time of flow. Like suppose if this is your catchment area and here the time of entry is somewhat 2 minutes or 5 minutes and this time of flow is 10 minutes. So if you add both of this, you will get time of concentration as 15 minutes. So you will use this formula for getting the critical rainfall intensity in centimeter per hour. Here only you have to substitute the TC which, will, which you have calculated, you will get the answer in centimeter per hour. Similarly, if time of concentration is greater than 20 minutes, you can use this formula, right? In books, you can find that if it is this A is 75, B is 10. So basically, I have directly written that. Fine, understood? So now, you can cal you calculated the dry weather flow, you calculated the storm water, you will add both of this, you will get the total discharge. Sometimes what happens is, this storm water, if in case they'll give you Dickens constant or Rives constant, you would have studied this in your hydrology irrigation part. So what happens is, you can use this empirical formula. <coughs> that is your Dickens formula, which is CD a to the power 3 by 4, Rives formula CR a to the power 2 by 3, where CD is your Dickens constant, CR is your Rives constant, right? Now, sometimes what happens is, me as a student was also having the confusion like since it is an empirical formula, obviously I have to memorize. So 3 by 4 is in Dickens or it is in Rives. So there is a simple trick I can say. If you add this 3 plus 4, 7, you will see the alphabets in Dickens is also 7. Fine. And if you will do your 2 by 3, so 2 plus 3, 5, you will see the alphabets also is 5. Right. So this also you can get storm water discharge. Just one thing. Here the catchment area was in hectares, but here the catchment area is in kilometer square. So you don't ever make a mistake in this, right? Now, total design discharge is DWF plus storm water, as I told you earlier. Now, there comes into picture self-cleansing velocity. What is this self-cleansing velocity? What happens is, this velocity is the minimum amount of velocity which is required so that no sediment settles or it is present at the bottom of the sewer. Fine. So this is basically the self-cleansing velocity. It is given by this formula 1 by n r to the power 1 by 6 k dp gs minus 1 to the power half. Where n is your Manning's roughness coefficient, r is your hydraulic radius, k is a constant, dp is particle size and gs is your specific gravity. So this could be asked in your one marks, they will give you all these values and generally for calculating these values in virtual calc is little bit tedious. So that's it, you can calculate it provided you remember the formula, right? Now moving to the partial characteristics of circular sewer. What happens is you would have seen a question as already regarding the graph, it would ha it has came in gate examinations where Q by small Q by capital Q all that was given. So let us focus on this. This is a circular sewer with the depth of flow D and capital D was the diameter of the circular sewer. So now what happening, I'm not telling that this small D depth of flow is half the diameter 
or it is twice the diameter. I am not telling anything to you, but it is generally any depth d. Now what is happening is it was wouldn't have been twice the diameter. It would have been equal to the diameter of half the diameter, right? So now what happens is small d by capital D is equal to one by two one minus cos alpha by two. Now you should see from this figure, small d is the depth of flow, capital D is the diameter, alpha is the angle subtended. Similarly, small a by capital A, you can calculate from this formula. Just one thing, what is this capital A? This is the diameter, or basically this is the area of the circular sewer. That is pi by 4 capital D square. Similarly, if you will see the perimeter formula, you will see the capital P, you can write it as 2 pi r or you can say it as pi capital D. Similarly, there will be a formula for your hydraulic radius, your discharge. Discharge is what? Velocity ratio and area ratio. And this is your velocity formula. Just one thing. In case this Manning's roughness constant is same. So what will happen? You will only this n and n will get cancelled out. This value you can substitute it from here. You will get it. Right? So it will be 1 minus 360 sin alpha upon 2 pi alpha to the power 2 by 3. In this way you can get it. Now what happens is if there would have been a sewer pipeline where this cap small d would have been equal to d by 2. That is half the dia of the pipeline. In that case your hydraulic radius would be same. This thing I haven't mentioned, but I'm just telling you, right? Just remember this. Fine. Now, moving to equal degree. Whenever there is equal degree of self cleansing, two pipelines are there, but the slope is different. If one has a slope of one upon three hundred, and another has a slope of one upon two fifty, then what comes into picture is your this formula. You can write in this form also. R s is equal to R small s, right? In this manner also you will get it. This is the formula which is exclusively used when there is equal degree of self-cleansing for two pipelines laid at different slopes. Now velocity you can see n by n small r by capital R to the power 1 by 6. This is your velocity formula. This is your discharge formula. For what? When you have equal degree of self-cleansing of two pipelines laid at different slopes. There are some things which are some points basically which are important for you. Let's focus on that now. If Manning's constant n is assumed, basically the Manning's coefficient n is assumed to be constant with depth, then you have this relation into picture. This is nothing like if you see this formula, I'm telling that Manning's n is constant. So this will get cancelled out and you'll get r by capital R to the power 2 by 3. So basically small v by capital V is equal to small r by capital R to the power 2 by 3. Now likewise for constant n, if at, it has a constant n value, then velocity of flow is maximum when your small d by capital D is 0.81. Similarly if your n is constant, discharge will be maximum when your small d by capital D is 0.95. This point last one is important. What happens is when the minimum velocity which is required for self cleansing is not provided, just increase the dia of the sewer or increase the slope. Any way you can do, you will be able to achieve the minimum velocity which is required, right? So these were the important things, important formulas which were regarding your sewerage system. So now, Moving to the treatment of sewage or you can say sewage treatment part. What you can see here, I have drawn the diagram that what is the processes which occur in the sewage treatment part. Now let us look at that. First you have screens, then you have grid chamber, skimming tanks, PST is for your primary sedimentation tank. Then you have secondary treatment, after which you have secondary sedimentation tank, then tertiary treatment if required and then the disposal of sewage or disposal of effluent, right? So now we'll move step by step. First, let us talk regarding the screens. What happens is when you use screens generally, first of all, what is the use of screens? 
they are used for removing large floating matters like paper if any paper bags are there any type of uh, floating matter which is there it can be removed with the help of screens similarly if i asked you how it is placed so it is placed at an inclination so that wider amount of floating matter can be arrested now when is the cleaning required for that i'll tell you what happens is you calculate the head loss through the screens what is the amount of head loss which is occurring generally it is given by k upon 2g v square minus u square when you substitute the value of k and g you will get the value as point 0729 v square minus u square where capital v is the velocity through the screen and small u is velocity above the screen and since it is an empirical equation which you are getting so both u and v will be in meter per second that is the velocity will be in meter per second now in the screens we have two different types one is your coarse screen other one is your fine screen so if you go to the coarse screens they are much used as compared to the fine screens if you ask me the reason i can tell you or you can yourself understand since if it is a fine screen more amount of floating matters get clogged that is frequent clogging occurs because of which frequent cleaning is required right and when i'm i was talking like when is the basically the cleaning required when the head loss reaches to 50% then cleaning of screens is required you can't use that screens definitely you have to clean the screens and you have to use it again for the treatment purpose right so now moving to the grid chamber part after screens large uh, floating matters are removed we'll move to the the sewage basically is moved to the grid chamber here what happens is your inorganic particles be it, be it your grit or sand they are removed but we don't want that organic particle should be removed organic particles effluent basically they should be present obviously they will be present in the effluent and the effluent from grit chamber should pass to skimming tank or it should pass to psd but it shouldn't settle down in grit chamber that is the main reason fine and so if you don't want the organic particles to settle down so basically a minimum scouring velocity or basically the critical scouring velocity is required so this is given by first you denoted by vh it is generally 3 to 4.5 root over gd gs minus 1 where gs is your specific gravity right so in this manner you can calculate the critical scour velocity in grid chamber fine now inorganic particles are removed now we will be moving to the skimming tank what happens is when any oily or greasy particles are present obviously they has to be removed so they can be removed in skimming tank fine now obviously when these oil and grease particles are removed there is certain area which is to be present or basically certain area of skimming tank is required so if you want to calculate the area through the skimming tank this is the formula 0.00622q upon vr where q is the rate of flow of sewage or you can say sewage flow rate in meter cube per day and vr is the minimum rising velocity of the greasy particles or of the oily particles which is to be removed in meter per minute right so in this manner you can calculate the area now after this the effluent from the skimming tank is passed to the primary sedimentation tank or you can say it as primary clarifier what is this primary clarifier so i have already told you in the treatment of water part like you have quiescent type continuous flow type in continuous you flow type you had horizontal and vertical flow type so that's all we have discussed everything regarding that so i'm not mentioning or discussing it here fine we'll be moving to the secondary treatment just one reason why i asked you or why i told you that remember this block diagram because if whenever anybody ask you or if it's as in the paper any case 
that where is skimming tank placed you should remember you should have that picture clear that it is placed before pst primary sedimentation tank after grit chamber right now moving to the secondary treatment or we can say the treatment basically the secondary treatment only so in this what happens there are three different manners specifically like prickling filters oxidation pond and activated sludge process out of these three any treatment can be you given to the sewage basically as secondary treatment so we'll be moving one by one to this let us let me move here first then secondary sedimentation tank so that any particles which is present after the effluent which came from trickling filter or oxidation pond they'll be taken to the secondary sedimentation tank after which tertiary treatment like chlorination and all will be provided in case of presence of pathogenic bacteria after which effluents will be disposed of so now what happens is the sludge which is generated from primary sedimentation tank and secondary sedimentation tank this sludge which is being generated this sludge has is taken basically to the sludge thickener tank so the the volume can be reduced fine the moisture content also because this contains a large amount of moisture content as well after this they are being taken to the sludge digestion tank where di sludge is being digested that is why the name is sludge digestion tank and the sludge is taken both from pst and from sst that is short form of secondary sedimentation tank right this much is clear now what we will be doing we will be focusing each one by one first is your trickling filters so here basically trickling filters are of two types one is your conventional trickling filters you name it as your standard rate trickling filters low rate trickling filters anything and the second one is your high rate trickling filters so now what happens is here i have drawn a sketch basically of trickling filter just to explain you the <coughs> working of it right so now i'll tell you the difference also don't worry what is this and what is this first trickling filter you should remember this is an aerobic method of treatment second thing about is that it is based on attached growth culture now what is this attached growth culture the microorganisms which are used in the treatment these are attached to an inert medium or inert material basically fine and if i talk out talk regarding the suspended growth process in that the microorganisms are present in the solution or basically in the sewage which is to be treated and here they are attached to any inert material or inert medium right so now let us focus on this now sewage is being entered from here here you have been provided with rotary distributors so that the sewage can be spread on the filter media evenly fine there is even spreading of the sewage now this filter media are the sand and gravel particles after which the effluent which is generated with the help of proper under drainage systems which is provided it is being taken to the effluent channel after which it is passed to the secondary sedimentation tank so basically this is the whole procedure for getting your trickling filter there are many disadvantages also like you get odor nuisance bad smell comes because of this since it is an open so it is an open so basically what happens fly nuisance occurs ponding troubles occurs fine but still the area requirement is less efficiency is good that's why you use trickling filters now as i told you what is conventional trickling filter and what is high rate trickling filter so what happens is in some cases you do recirculation the amount of sewage or basically the amount of effluent which is generated what you do you just take a part of that effluent and you recirculate it so that process is your recirculation so whenever recirculation occurs generally it occurs in high rate trickling filters while recirculation doesn't occur in case of conventional or standard rate or you can say low rate trickling filters fine now come on let's move to that see as i told you recirculation occurs 
so who knows it can be single stage recirculation will occur once or it can be two stage that is recirculation will occur twice fine so now let us focus first on single stage trickling filter influent is passed to the primary clarifier that is primary sedimentation tank which is the effluent is taken to the trickling filter after trickling filter it is passed to the secondary clarifier and there is an effluent but a part of the effluent will be recirculated basically it goes to the influent and you can say as some part to the trickling filter but basically this one is important right understand this clearly so here you can see there is only in one step you can see single stage only one trickling filter is there your recirculation is occurring only once so this is your single stage trickling filter now i can use two stage trickling filter also what i have to take i have used two trickling filters i have taken two clarifiers secondary clarifier or you can say secondary sedimentation tank influent passing to primary clarifier after the first stage trickling filter the recirculation occurs again similarly here the effluent which is to be disposed of or which is to be passed the, a part of it is taken again to the second stage trickling filter fine so you can see two stage trickling filter two stages basically you are employing the trickling filter that is why it's two stage trickling filter right so this was regarding your concepts what is trickling filter fine and how single stage trickling filter is different and how two stage trickling filter what is the basic difference i told you now moving to the part which is important for your gate because ultimately you have to solve the numericals right so now let's talk about design what you can see this is exactly the same which i have drawn it here fine here i have written everything in short the effluent which is to be disposed of is to be passed to the influent again let me name this discharge as qr that is recirculated discharge then what happens i have this qi what happens is the discharge from primary sedimentation tank is passed to the trickling filter so it can you can tell it as influent discharge what is li li is the influent bod in books you can find it as yi also doesn't matter remember meaning should be clear to you li influent bod le is the effluent bod see treatment will occur certain amount of bod from pst is passed to the trickling filter and certain amount of bod is effluent so do you think that after treatment also the bod will remain same obviously not that is why only we are doing the treatment fine for the bod removal also so le is the effluent bod right now why i am talking about influent effluent i'll tell you first look at this recirculation ratio you can say it as qr by qi or you can tell it as r by i then you have recirculation factor which you tell it as capital f which is 1 plus ri upon 1 plus 0.1 r by i whole square now the place where you make mistake let me tell you that what happens in in question sometimes they give you recirculation factor sometimes they give you recirculation ratio but you every time get confused in place of ratio you take it as a factor and all that mingling up you do fine so remember when recirculation ratio is given that is r by i is given and you have to substitute this value here and calculate the recirculation factor and if directly recirculation factor is there you don't need to calculate anything but what you guys do i don't know you take this recirculation factor you have it in your mind you take it as r by i and then you calculate it fine so don't do that now you got the recirculation ratio recirculation factor but why this recirculation factor is used let us see this this is the efficiency whenever somebody ask you to calculate what is the efficiency of the trickling filter you can calculate it with this formula that is 100 upon 1 plus point 0044 root over y upon vf now 
you can see this is something something you can look like it is an empirical formula so obviously you have to substitute the units in which it has asked you right so now what is this y basically it is the total organic load in kg per day which is applied to the filters fine you have to substitute it in kg per day remember this this is important similarly the volume filter volume you have to substitute in hector meter one half hector is how much one hector is equal to 10 raised to power 4 meter square in case if they give you the volume in meter cube substitute convert it into hector meter and substitute it here to get the efficiency right now efficiency can be calculated by like you get influent bod li you get effluent bod le so influent minus effluent bod upon influent bod into 100 will also give you the efficiency now for low rate trickling filter or you can say standard rate trickling filter this there is no recirculation of uh, occurring of, i told you right so this r by i will be zero substitute it here we'll get recirculation factor as 1 so now if they'll give you four statements recirculation ratio is zero factor is zero recirculation ratio is zero factor is 1 or all that permutation combination be clear that ratio is zero not the factor fine now <coughs> this i talked regarding the single stage trickling filter if in case there is a two stage trickling filter then how can i calculate the efficiency so now let me be, be clear fine whatever efficiency you got till here for first stage that will remain the same now you will do calculation for the second stage now come on let's see final efficiency in the two stage filter is equal to n dash in percentage or eta dash basically 100 upon 1 plus 0.0044 upon 1 minus eta root over y dash upon v dash f dash now what is this y dash v dash f dash y dash i'll tell you first whatever is the effluent which came from the first stage obviously it will be the influent for the second stage getting me i'll repeat again whatever is the effluent from the first stage it will be the influent for the second stage right so that is only i have written total bod in effluent from first stage in kg per day the effluent which is being generated from the first stage but the units won't be getting hampered the y dash will be in kg per day v dash will be in hector per meter and what will be v dash it will be the second stage filter volume similarly f dash is the recirculation factor for the second stage eta dash is the final efficiency which you obtain after the two stage filtration right so i hope this whole thing regarding the trickling filter is clear to you what are the formulas which we use which we have discussed one thing more in some cases what they give they give you influent bod effluent bod and they ask you organic loading rate something like that so what you can do is you can calculate the efficiency from here substitute it here and they'll give you volume and everything so you can directly get it from here what the organic loading rate this thing you should know fine now let's move to the oxidation point i'll tell you basically oxidation pond is generally an aerobic method and what happens in oxidation pond a symbiotic relationship is maintained the like a symbiotic relationship what do you understand is like i'm teaching you and you're promising me that okay ma'am we'll give you a good rank in gate examination so what is happening i'm teaching you you are giving good rank in gate examination i'm becoming happy so what is this this is give and take relationship it is happening so now what is happening a symbiotic relationship symbiotic relationship what happens like algae which is present in the oxidation pond obviously it is an earthen basin so you have to dug a oxidation pond of around 1 to 1.5 meter depth so what happens is the algae which is present it utilizes sunlight and it gives out oxygen this oxygen is used by microorganisms 
for the proper either decomposition or oxidation whatever basically here it is oxidation point so obviously oxidation will occur for its oxidation and these microorganisms releases what carbon dioxide nh3 phosphate which is again used by algae for its growth so what you can see there is a symbiotic relationship algae is giving oxygen oxygen is used by microorganisms they are giving co2 nh3 which is again used by algae fine but this is a symbiotic relationship which is existing so this is basically you can see it in the case of oxidation point now here i have mentioned these data just for your information these won't be important for your gate examination if it have been eac conventional then you should have remembered now area required is 0.5 to 1 hector fine depth basically sorry the detention time dt is 20 to 30 days the depth which is required is 1 to 1.5 meter and the organic loading rate is 300 kg per hectare per day is basically the loading rate of the trickling filter fine so these are just the data questions here you can see one disadvantage of oxidation point just while looking at the data come and tell me fast just by looking at the data you can tell me here you can see that the area required is much more 0.51 hectare you can imagine if you can assume it as 1 hectare that means 10 raised to power 4 meter square such a large amount of area is required while in the case of trickling filter the area required is comparatively comparatively very lesser to that of the oxidation pond right now if it is asked you to calculate the det detention time like generally it is between 20 to 30 days but if they ask you to calculate it then what it is 1 upon kd log base 10 l upon l minus y where l is the bod of the effluent which is entering the pond don't uh, just confuse that the bod which is leaving the pond basically that amount of bod is entering the plant or basically the oxidation pond fine and y is the bod removed that is 90% of l 80% of l that is the bod removed so you can calculate the detention time now what happens is sometimes they ask you regarding area of oxidation pond so let me explain how can you calculate the area suppose they'll give you bod of 5 days in mg per liter fine the amount of sewage which is entering the oxidation pond is also given to you let us suppose it will be given in liter per day and you are asked to cal they'll give you organic loading rate also and they'll ask you to calculate the area so what you can see if you multiply both of these this will be the total bod entering the oxidation pond because in 1 liter if suppose x mg is present in such a large amount of sewage how much amount of bod is present obviously you will multiply it so bod into qsw is the total bod which is entering the oxidation pond if you divide it by organic loading rate you will get the area now if you don't trust me you can see it from the units also see this mg per liter into liter per day will give me mg per day so i can write it in kg per day also if i'll convert mg in 10 raised to power minus 6 in kg per day and what is the unit of organic loading rate you can see it from here kg per hectare per day so kg per hectare per day so what will happen kg per day kg per day will get cancel out you will get the area in hectares fine simple and just one, one more thing kd is the deoxygenation rate constant at 20 degree celsius if it is for base 10 so basically it is 0.11 per day or 0.10 per day and for base e it is 0.23 per day and if it is asked you at any other temperature so you can write it as k20 degree celsius 1.047 t minus 20 degree celsius so for any other temperature you can calculate it right so i hope this oxidation pond is clear now we'll move to the activated sludge process so now moving to the activated sludge process now 
before moving i'll tell you once see here you proceeded in this manner now suppose there are no oil and greasy particles which are present fine there are no inorganic particles which is present so we'll use screens we'll use pst now in place of secondary treatment i told you that we can use trickling filter or oxidation pond or activated sludge process so here we'll use basically activated sludge process so here it will be activated sludge process secondary sedimentation tertiary treatment basically here it is activated sludge process that means you can understand some process is basically happening fine so come on i'll show you a diagram and based on that we'll study it what exactly happens now come on see this here the raw sewage is first entering the screens and then it moves to primary clarifier after the primary clarifier what happens see if the plant you can say if the plant is newly established or you can say newly installed so what happens the effluent from the primary clarifier along with 20 to 30% of the sludge which is present in the primary clarifier is be mixed fine and in the aeration tank we supplied oxygen for 4 to 8 hours what i told you initially when the plant is newly established effluent from pst plus 20 to 30% of the settled sludge is mixed and continuous aeration or supply of oxygen is provided for 4 to 8 hours then what will happen obviously you can see that in this process of aeration bod concentration is lowered down and bacterial removal efficiency is greater like if you ask me regarding activated sludge process 90 to 95% is the bod removal if sorry it is the bacterial removal efficiency and around 80% 80 to 85% is the low bod removal fine so you can see that in comparison to trickling filter you get a higher rate of bod removal but the main basically you can say the disadvantage or the demerit is continuous monitoring is required for the supply of oxygen fine continuous monitoring that proper uh, oxygen is supplied proper mixing is occurring or not all that he has to be monitored fine now in aeration tank happening all the process i told you uh, the effluent the sludge and the aeration which is being provided now what happens after this it has been passed to the secondary sedimentation tank where obviously you saw that the microbial microorganisms or you can say microbial mass which is present it is attacking on the basically the effluents which contains other particles or other substances fine for lowering the bod concentration for achieving a higher bacterial removal efficiency so now what happens after the aeration tank when the effluent is passed to the secondary sedimentation tank what will happen is the all the particles which are being reduced basically in the sludge or basically in the sewage which was present it is settled in the secondary sedimentation tank so the sludge which settled at the bottom of the secondary sedimentation tank is your activated sludge now the plant came into operation now this sludge a part of this sludge is being used is being transferred before the aeration tank now we won't use from the pst from the primary sedimentation tank we'll use the sludge from the secondary sedimentation tank this activated sludge basically the sludge which settled at the bottom that is the activated sludge is being used and again the same process effluent this time only the effluent from pst the sludge from the sst and the oxygen supply in the aeration tank fine here also if aeration is required we can provide it now a part of the sludge is being moved to the aeration tank while a certain part will be moved to the sludge thickener tank where moisture content is reduced then it will pass to the uh, pass to the sludge digestion tank and to the sludge drying beds so this portion we'll discuss later don't worry about it let's focus on this very portion fine now 
what will happen effluent from secondary sedimentation tank is passed to the chlorination and the effluent is disposed of here what we are considering only the sludge only the sludge part of sludge aeration and then the part of sludge to sludge thickener tanks right so this should be clear to you this whole picture should be clear to you regarding the activated sludge process because after this i'll be drawing the diagram and explaining you regarding the various terminologies which are very important for solving the gate questions right so this much is clear now come on let's move further here i have drawn basically you have you can see it here here i have drawn the same thing what i have done it before now just one thing you can see here i have taken the effluent from the primary clarifier you can see from primary clarifier you will getting a certain amount of discharge and a certain amount of bod so exactly same thing i have written it here q is basically the discharge coming from pst y not is the initial bod fine now this is the aeration tank in wh in which whole activated sludge process is occurring the volume of the tank is v xt is the mixed liquid suspended solids that is the amount of suspended solids which is present that is your xt and y is the bod of in which is there in the aeration tank which is present now look at this photo q was the uh, discharge from the pst fine now what is happening is q discharge passed to the aeration tank but we required a certain amount of activated sludge so a certain amount of activated sludge is passed here so that you are getting what q plus qr is the discharge which you are getting now this are all are interrelated fine suppose q plus qr some amount of return sludge you got and q plus qr is the total discharge you are getting now what i told you a part of it will be taken and a part of it will be the effluent now q plus qr plus qw will be taken so what is happening if out of q plus qr qr plus qw is being taken out then how much is remaining obviously you will subtract from this this value what you will get q minus qw is the effluent you can name it as qe also fine and xe is the concentration of effluent fine so now this much is clear now coming to this part this qr plus qw is the amount which is being withdrawn from the secondary sedimentation tank out of this if qr is the sludge which is being taken it again that is it is the returned sludge and qw is the wasted sludge fine qw is the sludge which is wasted which is passed to the sludge thickener tank and all that so what is happening xr was the concentration of solids in returned sludge as well as wasted sludge so here also you can say xr is the concentration of returned sludge and here you can use xw or xr whatever you want xr is the concentration of solids in wasted sludge right so you can see it here this diagram should be clear to you right you are getting na q plus qr out of this q minus qw is effluent qr plus qw is coming out qw is the wastage qr is the return sludge which is again going in this process right now what is the detention time or you can say what is the hydraulic retention time or it can be as what is the aeration time how can you calculate that just one thing before that xt is the concentration of what xt is mlss that means mixed liquor suspended solids concentration of suspended solids in mixed liquor now what is happening is if in the question it has given you only mlss use that in solving the questions but if they give you two values like mlvss and they'll give you mlss fine then what you will use they'll give you value like mlvss and they'll give you mlss then remember you will take mlvss that is mixed liquid volatile suspended solids 
here it is mixed liquor fixed suspended solids and if in the question this and this value is given you will take ml vss value fine and if it is not given you have to take ml ss only simple fine now what is the aeration time or what is the hydraulic retention time it is what the volume of the tank that is the volume of your aeration tank in meter cube divided by the rate of sewage flow in the tank that is the amount of sewage which is entering in the tank now there is a twist you some students make a mistake that what they'll do they'll add ma'am this q was also coming this qr is also coming so the total q will be q plus qr no here in the detention time you'll only take the amount of discharge the amount of q which is coming from the primary sedimentation tank only fine so v by q you won't take from the return sludge right now moving second to food to microorganisms ratio what is that food to microorganisms ratio in this what you will have daily bod which is applied to the aerator system upon the mass which is present in the system now you can see here also no return sludge if 1 liter contains certain let us suppose x amount of m x mg of bod then the total amount q will contain how much q into why not so that is the bod which is being applied to the aerator system that is q why not then what is the mass in the system what is the microbial mass because food to the microorganisms food you are supplying in the form of bod and this bod has to be lowered so who will be lowering it obviously the microbial mass so what is the mass of the microbes in 1 liter if you have so let us suppose x mg of mixed liquid suspended solids so in total volume how much is the concentration of microbial mass v into xt right so this is the f by m ratio and like f by m ratio shouldn't be less than 0.3 otherwise bulking of sludge occurs that is no proper settlement of the sludge occurs no proper settling occurs when bulking of sludge happens right so this is your f by m ratio why not is the initial bod q q is from where where it is coming it is coming from pst right now moving further volumetric bod loading or you can say it as organic loading what is that mass of bod which is applied to the aeration tank how much is applied i already told you when i discussed regarding here total bod which is applied how much it is applied q into y not is the bod applied divided by volume of aeration tank which is v in meter cube right now this you understood obviously just once understand how much amount you are supplying what is the volume which is there fine so you can see it here you are applying q y not and how much amount of microbial mass vxt simple similarly you can see it here how much mass you applying q uh, y not and what is the volume of the aeration tank that is v now similarly moving to sludge age what is sludge age this is mass of suspended solids which is there in the system divided by the mass of solids leaving the system system means your tank only fine that is and what is sludge age the amount of time the organisms are basically the sludge is basically basically you can say microorganisms which is present in the aeration tank fine so now what is happening is mass of suspended solids in the system so what is in the system v into xt and what is there which is leaving the system you can see it here what is leaving the system qe into xc or you can say q minus qw into xc it is leaving the system similarly qw into xr it is leaving the system fine there is no connection now they are leaving it fine so what you are getting qw xr plus q minus qw into xc 
fine the time the time sludge is ages basically the time where the activated sludge process was happening it was basically the suspended solids were there so what happened is mass of suspended solids in the system and it about divided by leaving the system will tell you the amount of time it remained in the aeration tank fine now in case if the value of xe is very small you will take the sludge age as vxt upon qw xr fine now you get the sludge age basically in days what is svi that is sludge volume index basically this is the volume occupied by a volume occupied in ml remember the unit volume occupied in ml by 1 gram as i have mentioned by 1 gram of solids in the mixed liquor after it gets settled for 30 minutes means what is the amount of volume when 1 gram of suspended solids has occupied right now vob upon xob into 1000 ml per gram what is this vob vob is generally given in ml per liter and xob is given in mg per liter that is why when you divide both of this liter and liter get cancel out and you get ml per mg and this mg when you convert it into gram you get this 1000 here fine so you can uh, know it that it is the volume which is occupied in ml by 1 gram of solids in the mixed liquor fine so you can see it from here fine so i hope this activated sludge process is clear to you now we'll move to sludge digestion tank so now moving to the sludge digestion tank as i told you earlier when i have drawn the diagram at the very first regarding the treatment of sewage that i told you each and every units in which manner they occur what is their functioning so here i told you remember that uh, sludge from primary sedimentation tank and sludge from secondary sedimentation tank are being taken to the sludge digestion tank right from sludge digestion tank what will happen they will be taken to sludge drying beds and after which disposal will occur so now can you answer a question like if this sludge from pst or sst primary sedimentation tank and secondary sedimentation tank instead of being taken to sludge digestion tank if they are directly disposed of then what will happen can we do that first of all and if we can do then what will happen come on tell me so i'll give you an answer that of course you can do it of course uh, sludge digestion tank if you don't want to go to sludge digestion tank you can directly dispose of but what will happen is your all the sludge which you are disposing it off it will be naturally a health hazard and it will create pollution as well so it's better to treat the sludge in sludge digestion tank fine so now what is this sludge digestion tank so i'll tell you it is a circular rcc tank which has a hopper bottom fine now what happens exactly in sludge digestion tank so what happens is the organic matter which is present is decomposed that is the sludge is stabilized by decomposing the organic matter but under controlled conditions now you can ask why controlled conditions because my dear students as i told you initially in the activated sludge process that uh, proper amount of oxygen is to be supplied in the aeration tank for 4 to 8 hours proper monitoring is required such as to see that continuous o2 is being supplied so here also controlled conditions means you have to see that the ph is maintained you have to take into account that the temperature is maintained right because there are certain bacteria like mesophilic bacteria thermophilic bacteria they have a different working temperatures so you have to take care that proper temperature proper ph and many other factors are there which has to be maintained that is i have mentioned it here also under controlled conditions once the sludge is stabilized you can take it to drying beds and dispose it off fine so this is exactly which i have written and this whole process is called sludge digestion and the tank in which this process occurs is known as your sludge digestion tank right 
after this now what happens inside the sludge digestion tank i told you the overview regarding the sludge digestion tank now what exactly happens in the sludge digestion tank the sludge basically is broken into three different parts fine first one is your digested sludge second one is your supernatant liquor and third is your gases of decomposition now what are they let's discuss that digested sludge is basically a solid humus which is tarry black in color fine what you will observe here that the volume of this digested sludge is approximately approximately you can say around 1 by 3 of the volume of undigested sludge first thing in the digested sludge the moisture content percentage or you can say the percentage of moisture content is also reduced and if you this digested sludge you dewater it then you can dewater it dry it then you can use it as a fertilizer also right so now you are clear with this digested sludge now moving to supernatant liquor what happens in supernatant liquor is it has a high bod concentration now high you understand how much it is around 1500 to 3000 ppm or you can say 3000 mg per liter such a high concentration of bod is there right now third one is gases of decomposition in the process of sludge digestion the gases which are predominantly occur or released are your methane that is around 60 to 70% of the gases are released of methane then 30% is your carbon dioxide and uh, some small percentage of other inert gases like your hydrogen sulfide and all right out of this you know that methane has a very high calorific value of course you know right so around just an approximate data that 70% out of it are volatile solids and 30% are non volatile solids or you can say it as a fixed solids out of the 70% 65% are reduced to gases right and if you ask me regarding the gases produced it is approximately 0.9 meter cube per kg of volatile solids reduced so basically this is the data that out of total 70% are volatile 30% are fixed in 70% 65% are reduced to gases the gases produced is equal to 0.9 meter cube per kg of volatile solids reduced right so these are just the data so i hope you are clear with this digested sludge supernatant liquor and gases of decomposition now basically after this we come that obviously if this digestion is occurring in a sludge digestion tank there will be some stages that first one stage will complete then second stage then third stage as you would have seen that if you want to give an exam for like you have to give it for ies fine indian engineering services so you have to clear prelims then mains then interview so this, there are the stages so similarly here what you have you have three different stages so let's move to that first is your acid fermentation second is your acid regression and third is your alkaline fermentation now what are they before dealing this you have to deal with two different things that what is acid former and what is methane former acid former if i talk about it is basically you can say an facultative or anaerobic bacteria this solubilizes the acid through the process of hydrolysis fine and acids and alcohols are converted to lower molecular weight in which lower molecular weight in the case of acid formers moving to methane formers methane formers are basically anaerobic bacteria first of all and they convert the acids and alcohols to gases fine so now what is your acid fermentation first we'll deal that acid fermentation what happens the sludge which is produced from the primary sedimentation tank which is acidic in nature because sludge is acidic in nature initially it will starts to digest in the first stage only that is acid fermentation and what will lead to its digestion is the facultative and anaerobic bacteria that is your acid formers fine now 
second is your ascent regression what happens you have seen your supernatant liquor so super, supernatant liquor which have high bod concentration that is the bod concentration which is very high is formed in acid regression what will happen when the bod concentration is high then a foamy scum layer is formed which will entrap all the gases right so this are the characteristics in the process of acid regression Now third is your alkaline fermentation. What happens in alkaline fermentation? The BOD which was formed, that is high amount of BOD, fifteen hundred to three thousand mg per liter, it rapidly falls down. The scum layer which was formed, it is being broken, and the gases which were entrapped, they are released. Right. So these things occur in the case of your alkaline fermentation. One thing more, your sludge will become alkaline in nature initially it was acidic now it will become alkaline in nature right and now it will happen here you can see here methane formers that is your anaerobic bacteria will be acting fine so i hope this is clear because obviously they have asked you already that what are the stages in sludge digestion tank in a sequence so you should know acid fermentation acid regression alkaline fermentation after which what can, they can ask you is they can give you the characteristic of any of these three and they can ask you that this characteristic occurs in which stage of the sludge digestion tank right so you should be clear that this uh, this characteristics occurs in which stage bod falls down it occurs in alkaline fermentation and all that should be clear to you right so this was regarding the theoretical part now moving to the numerical part like obviously if you are a civil in, if we are a civil engineers right so you have been asked to design a sludge digestion tank so for designing basically you need the dia of course and for dia you need the volume so if you know the volume that for such a quantity of such a meter cube of water i need to design it fine then you can calculate the dia so first you need to know the volume so basically the capacity or the volume of the sludge digestion tank can be calculated broadly in two different manners if you assume that the process of sludge digestion is linear and the second one is when the process of sludge digestion you assume it to be parabolic so if the process of sludge digestion is assumed to be linear then volume v is equal to v1 plus v2 by 2 into t where what will happen v is the volume of the digester that is the volume of the sludge digestion tank in meter cube v1 is the raw sludge the amount of sludge which is being added per day fine and v2 is the equivalent digested sludge that is obviously initially the sludge was undigested and after the sludge digestion tank process in what will happen in the sludge digestion process basically you will get the digested sludge so the digested sludge which is there it will also occupy a volume so v2 is the equivalent digested sludge produced per day on completion of digestion that is after the process of digestion is completed obviously you will get a certain quantity of digested sludge and it will occupy a certain volume right so v2 is that volume so v1 plus v2 by 2 into t right it will give you the volume of the digester now what happens is like in the case of monsoons you are not able to take out the digested sludge so it will accumulate in the digester so you have to provide the storage for the digester as well so in that case the volume formula is different there is one another component that is v2 capital t where v2 is you know that the digested sludge which is produced it will remain there because you are not taking it out and capital t is important because it is the number of days for which this digested sludge will be stored for the amount of days for which it will be stored fine so this will be the total digester volume if you will assume or if you will consider the monsoon storage as well right now this was when your process of sludge digestion is linear if your process of sludge digestion is parabolic then 
your volume formula is different. What it is? V is equal to V1 minus 2 by 3 V1 minus V2 whole into T. Right? V1, V2, T, this is exactly the same which I have written it here. Right? Now, similarly here also if you have the monsoon storage one, then you have to add this component V2 capital T. Now, you have two different formulas. One is the straight line approach formula, one is for the parabolic approach. Out of this generally, parabolic approach formula is preferred for volume formula because it is more realistic as compared to the straight line approach. Right? Now, just one thing more, like if initially V1 is the volume of undigested sludge and P1 is the moisture content. Right? Similarly, you had V2 is the volume of the digested sludge and P2 is the moisture content that is percentage moisture content. Fine, here also P1 is the percentage moisture content. Right? So, in this case what will happen? V1 100 minus P1 is equal to V2, 100 minus P2. This relation you can use it. Where this P1 and P2 are the percentage moisture content before digestion and after digestion respectively. Okay? So now, V2 is basically like you can be told, it can be asked you, uh, they will give you relation between P1 and P2. Basically, they will give you the value of P1 and P2 moisture content. And they can ask you how much percentage of the volume is reduced, fine. Or they can give you one moisture content and one volume and second volume in relation to the first volume. That is V2 is V1 by 3. And they can ask you to calculate P2. So in this manner they can ask you, fine. Now, moving to septic tank. All of these things which I have discussed, these are sufficient for your sludge digestion tank. So now, moving to septic tank. Septic tank, if I talk about these, the septic tank we don't use in urban areas. This is basically used in your rural areas where you don't have any sewer pipelines or there is no drainage system. In that areas you use this. So what happens basically, what is this septic tank? This is like a primary sedimentation tank only. Fine, there is no difference between septic tank and a primary sedimentation tank. Now in primary sedimentation tank it is continuous flow type because we have studied quiescent and continuous. So it is continuous flow type and in continuous also we have two that is horizontal and vertical. So it is horizontal flow type continuous tank but there is a difference between that primary sedimentation tank and here. If you can see there is around 4 to 8 hours, 2 to 4 hours like that we provide the detention period but here Especially the detention period get reduced when you have sedimentation with coagulation, right? But here, the detention period is basically 12 to 36 hours, right? Such a longer detention period is provided in septic tank. And basically, the bacteria which is most prominently used in septic tank is your anaerobic bacteria, right? So, anaerobic bacteria is used and around 60 to 70 percent of the dissolved matter is being taken out or basically it is removed right in which in septic tank right so we don't use this obviously in our very rural areas where there is no drainage no pipes no sewer lines they now now also there is such communities prefer septic tank right now more advantageous as compared to septic tank we have hemhop tank. What is this hemhop tank? You also call it as a two-story digestion tank. Now, why you call it as a two-story digestion tank? Because in a single digestion tank, two processes occur. One is your sedimentation, second is your digestion of sludge, right? So, if you go to the principles of hemhop tank, first you have unit operation and the other you have unit process. What happens in unit operation is, you can see physical forces will be predominant, that is your settlement will be taking place, that is sedimentation will occur in the case of unit operation. 
while in the case of unit process your digestion of sludge will take place by chemical processes so on the upper chamber you have the sedimentation and on the lower chamber you have the digestion of sludge and why this hemoph tank is better as compared to the septic tank because incoming sludge and outgoing sludge are not being mixed in the case of your hemoph tank uh, hemoph tank unlike to that of the septic tank fine so i hope this is clear to you we have discussed all the things which are important which are necessary for your treatment of sewage part so now we'll move further so now we'll be talking regarding the disposal of sewage the disposal of sewage can be done either with the help of dilution or by sewage farming but whenever you want to do the disposal of sewage the most important thing is your dilution factor if you know the dilution factor then you'll know that what amount of treatment should be given either the treatment should be given or it should be disposed of directly into the sea into the rivers right so i have written here here disposal of sewage and the amount of treatment to be given depends upon the dilution factor and now what is dilution factor it is vs plus vw upon vs where vs is your volume of sewage vw is the volume of water right now you got the dilution factor what next you will do here i have written the dilution factor and the treatment to be given basically we want that a dilution factor should be greater as much as 500 500 or more than that so that the amount of treatment shouldn't be given at all right so i've written it here when a dilution factor is greater than 500 no treatment is required only raw sewage has to be disposed of directly but when your dilution factor is in the range of 300 to 500 what you need to do plain sedimentation is to be given that is preliminary treatment is to be given to the sewage and the effluent the effluent which is generated should not carry suspended solids more than 150 ppm or you can say it as 150 mg per liter right now if your dilution factor is in the below the range that is below 300 that is in the range of 150 to 300 you have to give the secondary treatment along with screening chemical precipitation is also required along with it the effluent which is generated should not carry suspended solids more than 60 ppm or you can say it as 60 mg per liter right and if it is the dilution factor is below 150 then obviously you have to do complete treatment that is right from the preliminary then primary and secondary treatment everything you need to do when your dilution factor is less than 150 right now this was regarding the dilution factor and the treatment to be given now what happens you can see that we always say that river generally has a self purification ability or you can say capacity so what happens there is various zones of river in which it tries to purify itself whenever certain substances are discharged onto the rivers so i have mentioned here the zones of pollution in river that is there are four zones zones of degradation zone of active decomposition zone of recovery and zone of clear water so basically these are the four zones and what happens in each zone we will study that the reason we need to study it i'll tell you what happens is somewhat if they can give you questions like they'll give you all these information and they'll ask you which zone does it signify so basically you should know the characteristics of each and every zone right now what is zone of degradation water becomes dark the water which is present it is very dark and turbid in nature in this region what happens fishes will survive but the algae which is present in the rivers will die or you can say will obsolete right and in this region do level saturation do falls to 40% right after this when you move to the second zone that is zone of active decomposition what happens is here it was dew falls to 40% but 
but in the zone of active decomposition it may even fall to zero it is the heavy polluted zone and in this zone fishes also die right now moving to the zone of recovery now what happens decomposition has has been done now it's try to recover itself so what happens here the do drop down to 40% here it drop down to zero so in the zone of recovery it again starts to rise to 40% of its saturation level moving to the zone of clear water what happens is water reaches to its saturation value below it was a 40% in clear water it reached to its saturation value and water become clearer fine that is it achieved its self purification capacity this whole journey it started right from degradation decomposition recovery and to clear water right now what happens if you want to calculate if you have been given the discharge of seawage and discharge of river along with its bod respectively then you can calculate the do mix if you have been given the do and a bod mix if you have been given the bod of seawage and river how come i'll tell you i haven't written what it is qs is the discharge of seawage qr is the discharge of river dos is the dissolved oxygen of seawage dor is the dissolved oxygen of river so with this formula you can calculate the do mix and bod mix right now there are certain things permissible level and all the standard cases which you have to study this one is not that important but still for your information purpose you should know now if somebody ask you does uh, your saturation do depends upon temperature yes it depends upon temperature generally you take saturation do as 9.2 mg per liter but for your information you should know that the saturation do 9.2 mg per liter is at 20 degree celsius similarly at 0 degree celsius you have 14.6 mg per liter at 30 degree celsius the value is 7.6 mg per liter right so these are the saturation do at various different temperatures similarly like if you have been given 5 days bod and if you want to dispose of in the rivers or in underground sewer pipelines what is the criteria let us study that 5 days bod should not be greater than 20 mg per liter if you want to dispose it into rivers fine similarly it should not be greater than 500 uh, sorry 100 mg per liter if you want to dispose of in the sea and if you want to dispose of in the land or if you want to if it is carried to an underground sewer pipeline 5 days bod should not be greater than 500 mg per liter fine this you should know now moving to the streeter pels equation like we started regarding the theoretical part but for numerical point of view what are the important things we will be studying here now if you want to calculate the do at any time t fine after time t basically then this is the formula with the help of which you can calculate the do after time t now what is this i'll tell you first i haven't written kd is your deoxygenation constant kr is your reoxygenation constant l is your ultimate bod at any time t of mixing right and do not is your do deficient what is this do not this is equal to do saturated minus do minus we can calculate the saturation do basically at 20 degree celsius only we take so it is 9.2 mg per liter do mix you can calculate it from here right so you will get it here your do not that is do deficient right and if in case you have been given the self purification constant in the question it means you have been given the ratio of kr by kd that is reoxygenation constant divided by the deoxygenation constant right you calculated this dt then you can calculate the critical time also with the help of this given formula you have to remember that in case instead of critical time if they ask you your critical do deficit you can use this relation for calculating the critical do deficit wherever f is written it is your self purification constant l is your ultimate bod right and now this is other way round for calculating the critical do deficit that is kd by kr l 10 raised to power minus kd tc and now if you are dividing this kd you will bring it in the denominator kr by kd you can get it here l by f 10 raised to power minus kd 
TC. Fine. So in any way round, you can calculate the critical D of deficient. Fine. So I hope all the important things which were necessary, which were important for the disposal of sewage part, although it's not much, but uh, all, there were some of the important things which were there in disposal of sewage. We have covered all that. So now we will be dealing with the solid waste management, all the important formulas which are considered and the methods which are important as per your gate point of view, right? So basically in solid waste management, what are the three types of waste which has been broadly classified, we will see that. So the three types of waste is your municipal waste, that is waste, garbage, rubbish, all that comes in your municipal waste. Secondly is your industrial waste, the waste which has been discharged from the industries, the effluents which has been discharged from the industries. So this will be your industrial waste. Last one is your hazardous waste, all the waste like which is generated from hospitals or petrochemical factories which carries toxic elements or toxic materials. So that comes under your hazardous waste. Right? So basically these are the three types of waste. Now quickly we will deal with the disposal of solid waste, what are the methods, fine, in one to two statements, right? I haven't written the statements, just we will discuss it off. So now the first one is your open dumping. What happens in open dumping is like all the waste which has been generated, it is disposed of to a low lying area. So you are disposing of the waste, but what happens is the mosquitoes, the flies, they breed in that and they are the disease causing elements, fine. So basically we don't do open dumping nowadays due to the spreading of such a malaria diseases because of the mosquitoes breeding onto these waste, right. So open dumping, I told you. Second is your sanitary landfill. Here also in sanitary landfilling, you dispose of the waste in a low lying area. But in an engineered operation, you dispose the sanitary landfilling by spraying DDT insecticides so that there could do, couldn't be any breeding of mosquitoes, fly or there wouldn't be any fly nuisance which would be occurring, right? Now, third one is your pulverization. This basically occurs whenever what happens is whenever your waste is grinded into a powdered form. That process is known as pulverization. So in this process, basically the waste is grinded. Its structure is changed. Basically, you can say when it was in a solid form. Now what happens is it is in a powdered form, right? So this is your pulverization. Now coming to the composting method. Composting method is generally done. What happens whenever there is organic matter which is present in the solid waste? In that case, we use the method of composting. Now, in this also you have two methods. One is your indoor method of composting, other one is your Bangalore method of composting. Indoor method of composting is an aerobic method that is done in the presence of oxygen or bacteria which uses oxygen. Similarly, Bangalore method of composting is done for anaerobic bacteria that is it is done in the absence of oxygen, fine. So what happens is like if you consider indoor method of composting, we pile up and turn the mass and keep it for 4 to 5 months by spraying the waste then the night soil and everything laying basically the whatever the waste is there organic waste and what happens we partly pile up the masses and after 4 to 5 months we generate a compost or basically you can say a humus which is a brown powdered form and which can be used as a manure like so uh, right so these this was the composting method you should know that it is done when the organic method uh, organic matter present in the solid waste is there fine so we prefer the composting method now coming to the incineration what happens in incineration is whenever you have any waste and the waste contains any substances which have a high calorific value. Like if you burn that solid waste, you will get a high calorific value. Then what you will do, you will use the disposal by incineration, right? So I told you what are the things like what happens in pulverization, powdered form, composting when organic matter is present. Incineration is done. 
whenever there is a any waste which has a high calorific values present right one more is there that is barging into the sea you dispose of the waste into the sea that is barging off to the sea right so these are the disposal of solid waste all the important things which we have discussed now for calculation purposes and for numerical purposes i have mentioned here the formulas if you could see it here the energy calculation formulas what are they are the basically three types of formulas questions has been asked already in gate examination so let us deal it here like if you want to calculate energy in kilojoule per kg dry basis including ash if ash has been included if it hasn't mentioned in the question that ash has to be excluded so you will use this formula that is energy of each component into 100 upon 100 minus moisture content this formula is used dry basis which includes your ash so what happens if it is telling that we don't want to include ash that is ash free basis so in this formula we'll subtract the percentage of ash also and then we'll get the energy in kilojoule per kg right now last formula is your de long's formula which is important like what happens if in a chemical composition you have been given the percentage of carbon hydrogen oxygen and sulfur then you can use the de long's formula here you can get the energy in kilojoule per kg the formula is 337c plus 1428 h minus o by 8 o is oxygen plus 95s i'll tell you c is carbon h is hydrogen o is oxygen and s is sulfur so if these components are given to you these percentage of these chemicals you can use the de long's formula for calculating the energy in kilojoule per kg fine so these were some of the important things which we have discussed in solid waste management So now we'll be talking regarding the air pollution. Now, in this air pollution, first we'll be talking regarding the pollutants. What is this pollutants? What happens is if there is any foreign matter which is present above its permissible limit, it is known as pollutants. Now, if we classify the pollutants, it is broadly of two types. One is your primary pollutant other one is your secondary pollutant primary pollutant generally directed from the source we have examples like SOx gases NOx gases radioactive substances well if you see the secondary pollutants generally what happens when two or more primary pollutants combine then it leads to the formation of secondary pollutants like your sulfuric acid ozone and pan that is peroxyl acetyl nitrite fine now, this is regarding your pollutants. Now, what happens if like what happens like in chimneys, large industries, if they discharge large amount of gaseous pollutants. So, what happens? Definitely, they will follow a path. So, the path taken by these gaseous pollutants when they are discharged through the chimney, it is known as plume. And now, we are interested in knowing the plume behavior. What is the plume behavior? So what happens before knowing the plume behavior, you should note certain terms like what is the environmental lapse rate. In short, you say it as ELR. What happens as the height increases, the temperature decreases and the rate at which the temperature decreases with the increase in altitude is known as your environmental lapse rate. This environmental lapse rate is not constant and it varies from place to place. Like for Jammu and Kashmir, it would be different environmental lapse rate. For Delhi, it will be different. So this ELR will be different at different places. Fine. Now, if I have to explain you two terms more, but before that, if I ask you that what is stable environment and what is unstable environment, could you tell me that? So, for this, you should know what is ELR and what is ALR basic significance. Like when your environmental lapse rate is greater than your adiabatic lapse rate, then you get an unstable environment. And when 
your adiabatic lapse rate is greater than your environmental lapse rate then you get a sub adiabatic lapse rate then you term it as sub adiabatic lapse rate and which denotes a stable environment fine now what happens is like the adiabatic lapse rate is constant and the dry adiabatic lapse rate is basically 9.8 degree celsius per kilometer fine now in or both of this you saw that as the altitude is increasing the temperature is decreasing but i have drawn it here what will happen if inverse of it will happen or if both are directly proportional that is with the increase of altitude the temperature is also increasing you can see it as the altitude is increasing the temperature is increasing this condition is known as inversion fine this condition is known as inversion right so now we'll see different types of plume because it's not necessary that the gaseous pollutant will follow one specific path only it's up to them they can follow they can vertically rise they can move it in a half a hazard manner they can move in a cone shape anything can happen so let us look what will happen at which condition so first moving to the looping plume i've mentioned it here it occurs in a super adiabatic condition so it should click your mind that in this case elr will be greater than elr and rapid mixing will occur it will be an unstable environment right so you can see highly unstable environment now moving to the second one that is neutral plume what happens in neutral plume vertical upward mixing it won't move to the left it will not move to the right or in a horizontal direction it will move vertically upwards right so what will happen upward vertical rise that is when your elr is equal to alr in this case your neutral plume is formed right now moving to the third one that is coning plume with the name only you can see that a cone like uh, basically the path will be followed by the gaseous pollutants and it will happen when your wind velocity is greater than 32 km per hour so i have written it here so you can see cone like formation occurs fine now what happens is in the case of fanning plume it occurs under extreme inversion condition now since the word inversion came you should understand that what will happen with the change in uh, basically the height or you can say with the increase in height the temperature is increasing so you can see it is increasing and what is alr it is constant so what will happen in such a case of extreme inversion condition your emission will occur only in horizontal direction so this you can see emission will spread only in horizontal direction fine this is clear now moving to the lofting plume if you see this lofting plume basically this lofting plume is the base out of all this this is the very good condition best condition like we'll study seven plumes and out of this if somebody asks you that which type of path of the pollutant should be followed then it should be the lofting plume right now what happens is in this case you can see first there is an inversion condition and then you can say al c alr is greater than elr that means it is a stable environment so what will happen all the pollutants will go up to the atmosphere and they'll be discharged no amount of almost no amount of pollutants will be in the ground so that we will be able to breathe it and we'll be having or suffering from health hazards so you can see first inversion occurs and then there is a stable environment in the case of lofty plume now moving to the fumigating plume this is the worst condition if you see the bhopal gas tragedy when methyl isocyanide gas was released so this was the condition this is just the opposite of lofting in this first inversion occur then the stable environment here first 
unstable environment occurred because first elr was greater than alr so unstable environment occurred and after that there was inversion so what happened was all the pollutants were on the ground surface were were here only nearby the earth surface they were not discharged onto the atmosphere so because of which was happened thousands of lives were lost and this was the reason fumigating plume this was the basically the pattern in which the pollutants were discharged right now the last one is your trapping plume what happens in trapping plume as the name suggest first you can see that there is inversion then your alr is greater than elr it is a stable condition and then again you have an inversion so you can see the plume is being trapped in the between where you have the stable condition and above and below you had the unstable condition so i've written also when inversion layer exists above the emission source as well as below the source so what happens in this condition you get the trapping plume so i hope this whole plume is behavior is clear to you it is simple if somebody ask you the lofting plume is the best and fumigating plume is the worst out of the all i told you the reason also regarding this fine so i hope you are clear with this air pollution part so now we'll consider what is the design of stag height that is what is the height of the chimney right so now the height of the chimney can be calculated in various ways first we'll be seeing the first formula that is h is equal to 74 qp to the power 0.27 now you can see that since it is an empirical equation so you have to substitute in the same units in which it has asked you right like if you want to get the height of the chimney in meter you have to substitute qp that is particulate matter emission in tons per hour fine now moving to the second equation like if just one more thing like if in the question you will be given the unit in kg per hour or in some other units so first make sure that before using this formula you will convert it into tons per hour right now moving to the second one the height of the chimney can be calculated as 14 qs to the power 1 by 3 where again you will be getting the height of the chimney in meter where qs you have to substitute in kg per hour that is the emission of so2 in kg per hour don't get confused when we were talking regarding particulate matter emission you have to substitute in tons per hour and when we are talking about emission of so2 it has to be substituted in kg per hour right so now we have to take the maximum of the two values which will be coming it will be the height of the chimney but now what happens the board has suggested a certain minimum value for the chimney for the design of chimney or you can say for the stag height now let us suppose you get the maximum value out of these two but it is the minimum it is minimum than the value which is suggested by the board then what you will do so that is why i have mentioned it here that first of all the maximum values out of the two will be taken for calculation now board has further suggested that these two equations should be subjected to the following minimum values that is it shouldn't be minimum from these values like if you if you are getting it here 20 meters here you are getting it 15 meters let us suppose so you will take 20 meters but this 20 meters is less than 30 meters and board has suggested that minimum value should be 30 at least 30 should be there more you can take but not less than 30 then obviously you have to take this 30 meter as the height of the stack right so here i have mentioned that for chimneys which is adopted for industries in general but not the thermal power plants one so you can provide height of the stack is 30 meter you have to provide minimum value exceeding no problem but minimum it should be this much for thermo power plants above 200 megawatt capacity but less than 500 megawatt capacity height of the stag is 220 meters and if the capacity is greater than 500 megawatt then you have to take it as 275 meter fine 
so if broadly if i can say you the height of the stack is maximum of 1 2 and 3 maximum of these three will be the height of the stack right now you calculated the height of the stack but if i ask you to calculate the effective height of the stack fine what is the effective height of the chimney so you can see this diagram here you can see this h which we have already discussed now right this is the height of the stack actual height basically and delta h is the height of the plume or you can say plume height and when i'm talking regarding the effective height this h is equal to the height of the stag actual height of the stag plus delta h that is the plume height right so h calculation i've already seen it here but now this delta h how to calculate this plume height that is important fine so delta h that is plume height can be calculated by holland's equation i've mentioned it here and i've written the formula as well right what is the formula for delta h first the equation is known as holland's equation and let us look at the formula v is d upon u 1.5 plus 2.68 into 10 raised to power minus 3 p into d ts minus ta upon ts right where if you want to get the plume height in meters you have to substitute this vs is your stack gas velocity in meter per second and d is the inside exit dia of the stack you have to substitute this in meters u i have written it here it is the wind speed in meter per second right these are constants remember p is the atmospheric pressure but you have to substitute it in milli bars like if they'll give you in pascal or bars first you have to convert it into milli bars and then you have to substitute it here fine d is again the inside exit dia which i have already mentioned ts and ta what are that ts is the stack gas temperature in degree kelvin ta is the air temperature in degree kelvin fine so if in case they give you in celsius make sure that in this equation you will convert it into kelvin and then you will use it fine so i hope these were the important things all the questions haven't been asked regarding the holland's equation but still why to take a risk so i told you that also fine so all these were the important formulas or important concepts regarding your air pollution so now coming to the noise pollution what are the important things and the important terminologies formulas which we have to deal or with the help of which numericals can be solved we will be dealing it here now first of all we will be dealing with the time period what is time period time period is equal to 1 upon f and what is f f is your frequency and if i will tell you that to define time period so it is the time interval between any two successive troughs or crest fine this is your time period similarly the wavelength the distance between like if this is a wave this is a sinusoidal wave so what will happen the diff the distance between these two is your wavelength or similarly you can say the distance between these two is your wavelength lambda right so now if your wavelength is lambda and c is the velocity of sound wave f is the frequency so the relation which holds true is c is equal to f lambda right this relationship will hold true now coming to the root mean square pressure this will be equal to root over p square t that is this is the pressure at any time t and i'm interested in knowing the root mean square pressure so what it will give me it will be the root over 1 by t that is the total time integration from 0 to t p square t dt fine this will give me the root mean square pressure now there is one more relation which is sound pressure is equal to total atmospheric pressure minus barometric pressure 
if you know the atmospheric pressure you know the barometric pressure you can subtract and you can get the sound pressure fine so this is the way in which you can calculate the sound pressure also now moving further if you know the intensity of sound or if you want to calculate the intensity of sound it will be equal to w by a now let us know what is this w and a <coughs> sorry this i is basically the intensity of sound wave but you have to take care of the units also this will be in watt per meter square then you have w which is the power of sound wave in watts then you have a which is the unit area perpendicular to the direction of wave motion whatever will be the direction of wave motion this will be the unit area perpendicular to that direction of wave motion right now this intensity can be calculated in this manner also how it is square of your rms pressure divided by rho c and what is your c i have already told you velocity of sound wave so here also this c is a velocity of sound wave but since it is an empirical formula so you have to take care of the units this rms sound pressure is in pascals the unit is in pascals because pressure basically we can measure in pascals we can measure in bar but here you have to measure it in pascal and this one thing more you should know that 1 bar is equal to 10 raised to power 5 pascal this you should remember fine in case uh, in question they will give you in bars you can calculate it or convert it into pascal also right what is rho this is the density of air or any medium in which the sound wave is traveling generally it is air but if any other medium is also there you can consider that uh, density of that medium and it is in kg per meter cube that means i is in what i you have to calculate so p rms is in pascal rho is in kg per meter cube and c velocity of sound wave is in meter per second in case if they don't give you directly the velocity but they will give you the temperature then also you can calculate the velocity of sound wave how by this relation c is equal to 20.05 root over t and what is this t t is the absolute temperature in kelvin here you have to substitute it in kelvin and here c you will get it in meter per second so you know you will be well aware that this is a empirical formula if i want to calculate the sound level fine and if i want to calculate it in bells generally in questions they don't ask in bells but you never know so why to take a risk so that's why if it has asked you to calculate the sound level you can calculate it as log base 10 q upon q not this will give you the sound level in bells now what is this q and q not i have written it here this is the measured quantity q is the measured quantity the quantity which you will get and q not is the reference quantity because whenever you are measuring something obviously you need a reference that with respect to this the sound pressure is this so the reference quantity is uh, q not which is taken into consideration and this is the sound level in bells in short you write it as capital b fine this much is clear now if you want to calculate it in decibel like here you got it in bells and if you want to get the value of sound level in decibel you can write it as 10 log base 10 q upon q not fine but the more important formula with the help of which you solve numericals is this one sound pressure level in decibel this is the reduced version of this only this and this formula if you want to calculate instead of q and q not if you are taking pressure into consideration then you will get this formula will be modified in this format what is the sound pressure level it is 20 log base 10 p rms upon 20 micro pa i'll tell you one thing in books you can find it two ways first they'll write 20 log base 10 p rms upon p reference so in place of p reference we write it as 20 micro pascal because 20 micro pascal is the reference unit which we consider right and since this is in micro pa so this has to be in micro pa that is micro pascal right now since you calculated lp that is the sound pressure level now if i am interested in calculating the sound intensity level So first I'll denote it as Li, fine, and I'll write it as 10 log base 
i divided by 10 raised to power minus 12 and what is this i <coughs> sorry i is in watt per meter square right so in this manner you can calculate the sound intensity level so now you calculated the sound level you calculated sound pressure level intensity level now you will calculate the averaging sound pressure level. Suppose you get the four readings, fine, and you want to calculate, like you get four different measurement of readings, 70 decibel, 60 decibel, 50 decibel, 55 decibel. So if you want to calculate the average, so it's not like that you can do simple average. You have to use this formula that is 20 log base 10, 1 by n, sigma 1 to n, 10 to the power ln by 20 and what these values stands for I have written here like LP bar is the average sound pressure level n is the number of measurement readings like if you have taken four readings you have taken three readings so the number is your n and ln is the nth sound pressure level in decibel and this n can be like if you have taken one two three up to the n values whichever you have considered. So you won't take simple average if you get four different measurements, three different measurements. Rather than that, you'll use this formula for calculating the averaging sound pressure level. Now, after this average, if you want to calculate the equivalent noise level, what happens is your fan is generating some amount of sound, your tube light is generating, your AC is generating some amount of sound and I'm interested in calculating the equivalent noise level. What is the equivalent noise which I'm getting? Like if suppose a fan is, I'm getting is 30 decibel for a certain amount of time, 10 minutes. For AC I'm getting a sound of 100 decibel for about 50 minutes, anything like that. So you have to take, suppose you have taken fan, AC and tube light. So this will be 1, 2, 3 the decibel of sound which you will be getting it here and ti like suppose the total time is 180 and time of fan which is operated is 30 minutes so ti for fan will be 30 upon 180 for ac if it is 100 minutes so it will be 100 by 180 so you will just add all those values because i have written it here summation right so this will be n is the total number of sound pressure levels sound samples basically like if there is three, like fan, AC and tube light. So N is what? Three samples. So first you will add for fan plus for AC plus for tube light. Li is the noise level of any IH sample. Suppose this one is for your fan, then you will add it for AC, then you will add it for tube light. And TI is important because what happens is sometimes you, many a times basically you make a mistake. You write it for fan, it is 30 minutes, you write it as 30. No, I have mentioned it here. Time duration of ith sample expressed as a fraction of total sample time. This will be Ti. Fine? Now, this formula is important. Just consider this, this formula, this formula. These are the important formulas and this formula. Like I'll mark it here because questions have been asked from this formula. And then this formula you should remember at least important ones. Right? Now, <coughs> this in this uh, particular thing, if somebody asks you regarding the noise reduction value in decibel, so you can use this formula that is 20 h square upon lambda r, where your h is the height of the barrier wall, lambda as I told you earlier is your wavelength and d is the distance between the barrier point and the receiver point. Fine. So in this manner, you can calculate the noise reduction value in decibel. Now, this is one concept, ln concept. First, you have to deal with ln concept and then comes your L equivalent concept. So I'll tell you ln concept also. This parameter ln is a statistical measure. I've written it here. That particular sound is exceeded how much times? Like if I'm telling 80 decibel of sound, so how many times this 80 decibel of sound is exceeded? I want to know that. Fine. So like suppose I've written value of L60 in place of N, I have written 60 is 70 decibel. So if I ask you what does it signify, uh, signifies, you should tell me that the sound level will exceed 70 decibel for 60% of the measuring time. That is out of the whole time, 60% of the measuring time, your value will be exceeded by 70 decibel. Right? 
So this you should know. Now, here I have written in this part was important because questions have been asked regarding the residential areas. But for all the areas I have written like for industrial area, commercial area, residential area and for silent zone. What is the permissible limits of the sound during the daytime and during the night time? So for industrial 75 decibel in daytime, 70 decibel in night time. These values are in decibels only, right? Commercial 65 in day and 55 decibel in night time. Residential question has already been asked once, 55 decibel in daytime and 45 decibel in night time. And for silence zone, it is 50 decibel during day and 40 decibel during the night time. Fine. So these were the important things regarding the noise pollution which we have dealt. So today we completed all the important things regarding the quick revision, all those things. I think I have completed, com means I have taken into consideration the maximum possible things. I can't say 100% but still we have completed the maximum things on the basis of which you can solve your numericals or the concepts which can be taken into consideration while solving your questions. Right? So I hope you enjoyed this whole series of quick revision. Obviously it was time taking because environment is such a vast subject and you have to take the theory design concentration also into picture. So I hope you enjoyed this whole series. Thank you.